Mr. Allen? Can you hear the boardroom? Yes, President. You have to begin when you are. I call the meeting of the San Juan Unified School District Board of Education. I call the meeting of the San Juan Unified School District Board of Education to order. There is one co session item on tonight's agenda, conference with legal counsel regarding existing litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9 subsection D section one in Kincaid versus San Juan Unified School District Sacramento Superior Court case number 34202000286475. Mr. Allen, will you please give instruction to those in attendance via Zoom on how they can raise their hand if they have a comment on the closed session agenda item. And I've just been made aware that we are having a difficulty with the audio. President Viasquez and members in the boardroom, can you hear me now? Good afternoon, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, Mr. Allen. Mr. Allen, can you hear the boardroom? Mr. Allen, can you hear me? And giving it another try, President Viasquez, members in the boardroom, can you hear me now? Can you hear us? We can hear you. We can. Excellent. So uh, just to make sure, let me one more time quickly go over the ways to actually, I see that we have no attendees uh, with us on the Zoom call. So I will move straight to our written submitted comment for closed session, which comes to us from Scott Rafferty, who writes, 
I expect it to be admitted to Zoom in advance of the closed session and to deliver these comments live. We have made a proposal that we believe serves the interests of the district as well as the incumbents. We are prepared to tone down the rhetoric and focus on the details. A special election is cost efficient and allows these two districts to have a seat at the redistricting table. This proceeding was not intended to displace any incumbents, but to give the unrepresented areas in your district representation. A five member map at any time would have made it very difficult to avoid pairing incumbent trustees. It would be necessary to resolve this very quickly in order to avoid motion practice regarding the certification and I will try to be available to do so. And that is the only written comment we have received at this point. Thank you, Mr. Allen. We will now move into closed session and we will return to open session at 630.
Yeah, just talk. Okay. Mr. Allen, can you hear the boardroom? We can, President Vasquez. I'm going to start the recording now. I call the meeting of the San Juan Unified School District Board of Education back to order. The board is meeting in person at the district office boardroom. Safely physically distance is allowed with Sacramento County shift into the red or substantial tier of the state's COVID-19 risk monitoring system and aligned to state and local health guidance. Presenters will participate via the Zoom platform and are not present in the room. Public attendance is provided via the Zoom platform as well as a live stream on the district's YouTube channel. This meeting is being audio and video recorded and the recording may capture sounds and images of those attending this meeting. The recording will be posted on the district website. We thank you for joining us and for your patience as we use this format in an effort to maximize participation and access during this time of social distancing and other restrictions. At this moment, I'll invite you to please stand for the virtual presentation of the colors by the Del Campo High School Air Force Junior ROTC. Good evening and welcome. I'm Paula Viesca's board president. To my right is Dr. Michael McKibben, board vice president. To my left is Ms. Zima Creason, board clerk. To her left is Ms. Pam Costa, board member. Also to my right is Mr. Saul Hernandez, board member. And to his right is Superintendent Kern. Before we begin, I'd like to review the two methods that are available to submit public comment for tonight's meeting. The first option is to submit a public comment online using the comment form located on the district website at www.sanjuan.edu slash board meeting. If you wish to submit a public comment on more than one agenda item, please submit a separate form for each item on which you are commenting. Comments received by 6 p.m. today have already been shared with all board members. Comments received after 6 p.m. tonight, including those submitted during the meeting, may be read during the meeting depending on time restrictions. 
Comments may only be submitted on an agenda item up until the time the agenda item has been discussed. The second option is on the Zoom platform where you may use the raise your hand feature. When you are called on, you may share a comment via audio during the meeting. Please note that all public comments are subject to a two minute limit or approximately 1500 characters. With that, we are at item D, approval of the minutes. Are there any corrections to the minutes? President Viasquez, I have one um, addition to make. On the update of the learning model continuum, I-1, um, we wanted to add to main um, that under the TK-12, early childhood education will be part of reopening along with the TK-12 system on January 5th, 2021. So we wanna make sure we get that on the record. Appreciate the clarification. Are there any questions on that? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the minutes for the October 13th? As amended. Item as amended. I move. So move. It's been moved by Dr. McKibben. It's been moved by Ms. Seconded by Ms. Creason. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. We are at item E1, recognition of school psychology awareness week. Dr. Calvin, please begin when you are ready. Mr. Allen, we are prepared um, to hear from Dr. Calvin when ready. Dr. Calvin will be on momentarily. Thank you, Mr. Allen. I'm hot. Good evening, President Viasquez, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. The superintendent is recommending that the board adopt resolution number A397, proclaiming November 9th through November 13th as School Psychology Awareness Week. Here to accept the resolution is school psychologist Tracy Hewitt. Good evening, Mrs. Viesquez, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. Thank you for recognizing school psychologists by adding the School Psychology Awareness Week to our district calendar. School psychologists are mental health professionals who specialize in academic support. And especially during this very unique time, we've had the opportunity to engage our skills with direct services to students, consultation with school teams, including support for staff wellness, and collaboration with families to keep students engaged and accessing their education. And we thank you on, I thank you on behalf of the school psychologists for your support and your recognition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hewitt. And on behalf of the board, we, we thank you and are excited to acknowledge you. Don't typically do this, but I do wanna read just a part of the resolution and acknowledgement. Um, included in the resolution reads, um, school psychologists facilitate collaboration to help parents and educators to identify and reduce risk factors, promote protective factors, create safe, caring schools, and access community resources. And like everybody, they've been working over time to transition to our new learning environment um, and have continued to do it extraordinarily well and in service to our community. So we thank you very much and are proud to honor you. Do any of my, oh, thank you. a round of applause. Is there a motion to adopt resolution number A397, proclaiming the week of November 9th through 13th as School Psychology yeah. Awareness Week? So moved. Been moved by Ms. Costa and seconded by Mr. Hernandez. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. Thank you very much for joining us this evening and for all that you do. Thank you for having me. With that, we are at item E2, High School Student Council reports. Tonight, we will hear from student representatives from Encina Preparatory High School and Del Campo High School. 
Welcome, and let's begin with Angela Bernal from Encina. Angela, please begin when you are ready. Good evening, President Velasquez, members of the board, Superintendent Kern, and Ms. Cunningham. I am Angela Bernal, ASB Vice President from Encina Preparatory High School. To start off, distance learning has heavily impacted students, teachers, and staff at Encina. It has been difficult and stressful for many, especially seniors, since it is their final year in high school. Many students have internet and technical issues that interfered with their performance in their class. Angela, we've stopped being able to hear you. Are you still with us? Activities. Student government has hosted a Spear Week at the beginning of the year to celebrate the new year and get students excited for distance learning. This included dress up days and lunchtime activities where we played Kahoot and the new popular game Among Us. Seniors had a virtual scavenger hunt where some seniors went to have a good time online. We also have been welcoming our sixth graders by doing monthly web activities. The week of October 12 through 16 was our homecoming week where we put the home and homecoming and we came up with virtual spirit days to enhance school spirit. Highlights from our past and upcoming events can be seen on our Instagram page in Sina underscore Bulldogs. Even though we have struggled with being distanced from everyone for so long, we had some students who have kept being positive and participated in our spirit days. When coming back into a hybrid model, there are a variety of opinions students and parents have. On one side, there are students eager to come back to school and be able to once again have their hands-on learning experience. And on the other hand, many are still shaken up and prefer to stay in distance learning until they feel safe enough. Personally, I believe that there will be many complications with the hybrid model, such as students getting confused what day or what classes to attend for the certain day they are given and it would also be very hard to stop students from gathering amongst themselves in large groups and especially during passing periods and lunch. And it would also be hard for them to follow precautions properly. In the end, I feel as if it's best to be safe and stay in distance learning for the better good of student staff in the community. This being our senior year has been very complicated and an emotional journey. What we expect it to be a year full of joy and memories turned out to be a year where we'll, we will only remember our screens and the huge pile of homework. But on the bright side, this has opened many doors within the students and allowed them to see things in a new perspective. This experience had many seniors work harder than they did before and gain new skills to help them achieve their goals. This for sure will be an unforgettable and life-changing year. Thank you for letting me speak on behalf of Encina Preparatory High School. Thank you very much, Angela, for joining us and for your report. I just want to do a quick check. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Can I just ask you a favor? So somewhat coincidentally, right after your remark about some of your um, tech, tech, technology challenges, you cut out just a little bit. I was wondering um, if you can, and if you can't, that's okay. Do you mind just repeating the line that came after that? I wanted to make sure we heard your full report. The line after um, technology issues or? Yeah, nope, that one, perfect. Let's see. Um, so um, would it be the one, sorry, would it be the one when I'm- No, don't uh, apologize. Would it be where it says, um, like talking about the hybrid model or? the hotspots and Chromebooks. I think it was hotspots and Chromebooks. I don't remember hearing about that. So I think that's where we lost you for just a bit. And it wasn't too long. So just that piece there would be helpful. Yeah. Thanks to resources given to us, students were able to get Chromebooks and hotspots to improve their distance learning experience. Although there are many difficulties, there are many students and staff that are working hard to bring out the positives in distance learning. Perfect. Thank you so much, Angela. We really enjoy hearing our students speak, and I wanted to make sure I got all of your feedback. I'm going to turn it really quickly to see if any of my colleagues have questions or comments on your report. Ms. Uh, Ms. Creason? Thank you so much for your report, and I really appreciate you sharing the challenges as well. And I just want you to know that 
it's absolutely heard the stress le levels that are uh, present with the student body and staff and you know everyone just doing the best that they can in this really challenging time so just appreciate your realness um while we weather these waters together and regarding the tech challenges and i thought that was incredibly fateful that <laughs> we had a tech challenge as we were talking about tech challenges um, as a student, do, do you know where to go when you experience a challenge? Do you feel like you know what to do or who to go to for that help and that your student body also knows who to reach out to for help? I feel like I personally know what to do. Usually I would just, you know, a teacher letting them know I have problems. And I feel like most students know that um, they should contact their teachers or sometimes even their parent to let the school know they're having issues. Um, we really have the teachers do a good job on letting students know all the information they need. Great, thank you so much. My colleagues have any further questions for Angela? Thank you again for, for joining us. We really appreciate it. And thank you for also for your report and your feedback as well. Um, I definitely took that to heart as well and appreciated hearing from you directly. Next, we will hear from Kenzie Stokes from Del Campo. Kenzie, please begin when you're ready. Okay. Good evening, President Velasquez, members of the board, Superintendent Kern, and Ms. Cunningham. I am Kenzie Stokes, ASB Vice President from Del Campo High School. First off, I wanted to address how students themselves are doing with distance learning. It is, oh, sorry. I got a lot of information from them. Most students said distance learning is easier for them and way less stressful. They told me that they get their work done and once they do, they have a lot of free time once they log off their last Zoom for the day. Some students said, why would we go back January just a couple days a week if it is not safe enough to go back full time? A few students also informed me that the distance learning is easier for high school students but is mostly a struggle for those in elementary school. Personally, I like distance learning. I just miss all the extracurricular activities that we probably will not be able to do if we go back to school anyways. As for academics, I am doing just fine in my classes. All of my teachers are very helpful and very easy to get a hold of. On behalf of my peers, they feel the same way. As we plan to go back in January, me and my student government team have only talked a little bit about what we plan on producing. Our teacher asked us what the top three things we wanna do when we come back. Most of us said how our student body really loves homecoming halls and sports arama, which are two big events that we put on. But going back to a hybrid schedule, we don't know how that will look. I personally don't think we will be able to do either of them still being in a pandemic. We do not know how the rules will be by then, but we are hoping to do our normal lunchtime activities, canned food drive, rallies, halls, sports arama, and more. Being distant is hard for us leaders trying to bring school spirit virtually. We have learned that our student body doesn't really care for the things that we are trying to do. We recently did our first spirit week where students could dress up for the given day and submit a picture of them dressed up to our social media to then be put into a drawing for a chance to win a gift card. The most picture submissions we received one day was only seven. It is very frustrating to put in the effort to get those kind of results, but we are just trying to normalize things as much as possible given the circumstances. We had more success with selling our class shirts though. We sold them over a span of three weeks and it was very successful with the help of everyone posting it on social media. All classes have already had or are going to have class fundraisers and those are going well too. Our athletic teams like baseball, water polo, football, cross country, volleyball and basketball have all been able to start conditioning as of a couple weeks ago. I have communicated with a few basketball and football players to see how they're liking it so far. They all said it is going well and it just feels good to be back on campus. As for upcoming events, we just put out a TikTok talent show, which is a popular app for students my age, where they can submit a school appropriate TikTok video to our social media account and it will be featured on our page. Whoever submits an entry will be entered into a raffle to win a prize. We are planning to do another spirit week soon and we'll be working on a way to get better participation outcomes, whether it be better incentives or something else. Overall, I am super proud of the effort and enthusiasm my student government team has this year. Everyone is so creative in finding ways to do the same thing we normally do in school, but accommodating them with the safety precautions we have to take now. 
everyone has been working well to find ways to safely show school spirit virtually. And I am super excited to see all the things we will accomplish by the end of this school year. Thank you. Thank you, Kenzie, for your report. Really appreciated hearing from you. Um, do my colleagues have any questions for Kenzie? Ms. Creason? Thank you so much for your report. Um, I want to just thank you for taking the time to poll your peers and bringing that collective feedback uh, to your report. It really is helpful to hear um, what you're going through and your experience, um, but it's even greater when we care about more kids' experience in these um, short minutes that we hear, get to hear from our students. So I appreciate that. Just want to acknowledge, too, the stressful times and, you know, just acknowledge all the work that you're putting in to bring school spirit uh, to your community and I know it must be disappointing when we don't get the same results as we may have when we're in person, but, you know, I encourage you to keep it up because it probably does lift up a lot of days, uh, lift up the days of a lot of kids that may be struggling. Just appreciate uh, your commitment. Um, also, I did hear you say that for you and maybe some others that remaining in distance learning would be preferable. And unless something changed, it's my understanding that the district's committed to letting distance learning be an option, even when we go back to a hybrid model, whenever, you know, when we, when we do that. So I don't know if you were aware of that, but I just wanted you to know that even when we do go back, um, you will have that option. So, you know, families can make that, that choice of what works best, best for you. And then lastly, I'm really excited about this TikTok challenge. So I have TikTok, but I'm not really good at TikTok. So what should I search or what do I need to do to see your talent show? Um, so we are posting all of them on our Del Campo Instagram. Do you have Instagram? I do. Okay. I know how to use it. <laughs> My, our Del Camp, our um, main Del Campo Instagram. Let me look up the name for you. It's just Del Campo High School. And we're going to be posting them on there on our Instagram stories daily. As we get new submissions, we're posting them on there. And then we're going to make a collage of all of them um, on an actual post. Okay, thanks for that. It's so, that's so creative, I love it. Well, thanks so much for all you do. Thank you so much. Any further questions from my colleagues? Mr. Hernandez. Kenzie, I just, you probably will be gone when I talk about this a little bit later, but I had the opportunity to go on campus on Tuesday to visit the new Career Tech building in the back. I don't know if you've gone back there, but it's gonna be amazing when you go back in January to see it. But. Yes. Um, I'm so excited. I have been on uh, campus for sports and I have walked around a little bit and I'm excited to see the finished product. It's, it's amazing. Thank you, Kenzie. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Kenzie, for, for joining us and also just really appreciate a lot of your frank feedback. And I know, um, you know, it's engagement is hard, especially virtually. And so, but it, the great part of your presentation was it sounds like you guys are going to keep trying new things, which, um, you know, really just appreciate all your work and, and efforts. And I do know how to use Instagram, but not TikTok. So I'm going to leave that to you, Ms. Creason, to represent us. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, what we've learned is it always goes around better the second time around. So we're just going to keep uh, trying. <laughs> that advice is appreciated, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for, for joining us. We'd like to thank you for your reports and for being here tonight. Student voice is very important to the board and we really appreciate hearing from you directly. You're welcome to stay for the remainder of the meeting, but we realize you probably have a few other things to tend to. And um, so we also <laughs> invite you to go, go back to that to-do list as well. But thank you again very much for joining us this evening. Thank you, have a great night. We are now at items E3 through E6. Mr. Allen, do we have any reports from staff, board appointed slash district committees, employee organizations, or other district organizations? I do not have any reports from board appointed committees or employee organizations. I believe there may be one staff report, Mr. Kern. We do have one staff report, Mr. Kern. Please begin when you are ready. All right, thank you. I wanted to provide the board and the community updates on a number of items tonight. First, around our special education and bringing those students back. We are set to go on Monday, November 2nd, so next Monday, for our self-contained mod severe classes. All classrooms are staffed. Transportation has been secured. Side letters of agreements with our bargaining groups completed. 
De-escalation training provided for principals. Staff has the necessary PPE in place at sites and will go over health guidelines with principals and teachers this week. We have approximately 470 students returning at 30 different sites. This includes 17 preschool elementary sites, three middle schools, seven high schools, and our three centers. Just under 450 students chose to stay in distance learning for the time being and may stay as well when we return the entire system in January. So a little over 50% of our mod severe students are, will be returning to learning next week. Our Office of Student List Learning Assistance met with staff to plan for in-person services for English learners with a proposed start date of November 30th. We're targeting grades transitional kinder through two, levels novice to one, and that equals approximately 1,000 students. We have drafted a parent survey. The goal is to translate and get out to families this week, and we will begin conversations with the Teachers Association regarding a side letter agreement next week. Student support services has joined us in the EL planning meetings, and the goal is to have Bridges program available for families on November 30th to, su to support small cohorts. We released a final draft of our campus safe reopening procedures and requirement guidance documents to all school site leaders and those teachers who will be working with the special education small group cohorts. This week, Mr. Frank Camarda, Chris Ralston, Mike Jones, and Dominic Cavello will be hosting two separate meetings with site leaders and teachers to review the guidance document and answer any additional questions they may have as we prepare to reopen schools for the mod severe small cohort groups. As part of our rollout to the staff supporting the mod severe small cohort group, we will be collecting feedback on the draft document so that we can refine it prior to its final publication and larger distribution. In addition to this document, the Department of Teaching and Learning Leadership Team is developing a site leader reopening plan template to be used as a checklist to help guide site leaders in their planning and preparation for reopening in, G in January. We continue to move forward with our plans to bring back all remaining students on January 5th. Regarding the parent survey, our survey to parents should go out, be going out this week. I know two weeks ago I said it would be out before this board week and meeting and that was our intent. But we have tried to make it as detailed as possible so parents really understand the choices they are making. And when we have to have all of that information translated into Farsi Dari, Arabic, Spanish, Russian and Ukrainian, it can take some additional time, which has been the case with this survey. So we apologize that this is slowing down the distribution of our surveys. The survey will lay out the specific models, two at elementary and three at secondary, which we are exploring and ask families to commit to whether they would return to in-person learning or stay in distance learning when we return. This information is vitally important for us to gather from all families as it may potentially affect shifts in staffing for both students and teachers. San Juan Teachers Association is sending a similar survey to staff to gather input as well as we continue to negotiate a final model of instruction. Yesterday, Deputy Superintendent Bassanelli and Executive Director Shannon Brown from the San Juan Teachers Association presented to the Senate Education Committee at an oversight hearing focused on K-12 distance learning. They were asked, how are students across the state being served and how are they assessing online learning? Ms. Brown and Bassanelli were able to share information about our distance learning efforts lessons learned along the way, and highlight how our partnership has helped to move our work forward in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Site visits have been an important part of preparing to reopen. I had the opportunity after the last board meeting to walk schools again in Rockland with San Juan Teachers Association board, uh, President Bill Simmons. We were joined by Roger Stock, superintendent of Rockland Unified School District, as well as his teacher union president. We have had a number of other principals from high school middle school and elementaries visit sites in the past week or so. And this has been very helpful for our site leaders to observe how programs are operating under the current health conditions. Related to athletics, the executive director from the California Interscholastic Federation or CIF, Ron Nassetti, stated in a recent B article, we have been and continue to meet the California department with the California Department of Public Health about high school sports returning. 
We are hopeful that the numbers will trend in the right direction so we can start sports back up. Some of the topics still being discussed at the CIF and local high school levels are, when a season does start, how might schools test for the virus? Who would pay for the cost of these tests? And what sports might be allowed to be played? In exploring the CIF website today, I could not find any new information about when they might make these decisions. And we wanted to remind the community again that the decision to allow sports to move forward lies slowly in the hands of the CIF. Uh, regarding our equity department, uh, they launched a food to learn pilot with a donation drive on Saturday, October 24th. Over 75 cars dropped off an average of four bags of groceries. Some cars had full trunks of food. $825 in online donations were given, $1,300 in gift cards, checks, and cash donations. Real Life Church pledged to donate 100 boxes of food per, per week with nine schools participating, and that is Star King, Howe, Sylvan, Dyer Kelly, Kingswood, Edison, Encina, Cottage, and Whitney. And our own transportation department is gonna utilize their buses and has agreed to drop off the food at the schools for distribution to families in need. And so with that, I'd like to thank the board and I can answer any questions I have on any of the information that I've shared. Thank you very much for the update, Mr. Kern. Do my colleagues have any questions? Mr. Hernandez? Sorry, I gotta, I just wanted to make sure my mic, I, last week or two weeks ago, it didn't work very well. I just wanna thank Mr. Kern for this uh, report. And, uh, and and I just wanna also comment to the many parents out there and families that are, uh, as we heard that there's, there, you know, there's challenges in distance learning. We understand that. We hear you loud and clear. And, um, I, I, for one, wanted to begin school sooner than later, but as you can see, Mr. Kern and his staff has done their homework, and the, and the plan that is being prepared for our students is much better, and, and, and it's going to allow our students to be able to have a live teacher, um, well, more than not, and uh, that's the idea, and uh, it, it, we're, we're, we're facing some very tough challenges right now, but we're going to get through this. Parents, stay with us, and you're going to see that this is a better plan for all. And thank you, Mr. Kern, for that report. Yeah, and I hope when the, the survey goes out at the last board meeting, we talked a little bit about um, the, the trying to reduce the amount of times that are students that are on their own. And so really the models that they'll see have students interacting with their teachers, you know, whether it be between in person as well as virtually more than just two days a week. So that's really our hopes. Ms. Costa? We had a long conversation at Curriculum and Standards uh, last week, and I reiterated how much time our staff puts in trying to meet the needs of our students and meet the needs of their safety as well as their educational needs. And I think this report highlights the work that is constantly going on, the revisions as conditions change. I, for one, really want to commend all of staff for the work. And I know that the principals I talked to who visited up at El Dorado, we're very excited to have that opportunity that the district is willing to make those connections so they could go up and, and see other programs. I'm wondering about the November 30th opening for the REL learners and will that opening correspond with the models that we're sending the surveys? So will parents? No, that would be different. So it'll be a different model for for EL until January 5th. Yeah, because our, our ELs are, aren't in self-contained groups, and that's been one of the challenges, is if you're gonna bring back any of these smaller groups, they're, they're not necessarily with that teacher all day. They're with another kindergarten or first grade or second grade teacher. So we're just trying to find opportunities to bring those students back earlier to provide some of the supports that we know they need. And if my math is correct, only 51% of our 
moderate to severe students are coming back. Parents made the decision, 49% of the parents made the decision to have their students stay in distance learning. Correct. Okay. And I think, you know, even when you hear, hear from the students tonight, um, there's, we've got some high school kids that said they would, they believe it might be more beneficial. So I think the ability to allow those options, as Ms. Creason, you alluded to as well, um, is important uh, for our community. That choice has always been important. So as we come back to be able to do that. And, and again, watching the local health conditions, you know, I think if you saw what's happening in, in Sacramento County today, we're gonna continue to watch over the next two months. Um, we kind of ticked in the wrong direction today when we were hoping on moving closer to orange. So I think really it just behooves everybody to, as we have a desire to come back and see kids involved in those activities that we heard the students talk about that they're really missing um, and, and be on campus for all of us to do what we can um, so that, that we don't see those results going in the wrong direction. Exactly. And I think all of us want our students back. We just want them back safely. So thank you for continuing to make that a possibility. Ms. Creason. Ooh, thank you for the report. Just two things. When a family makes a decision about which model they want to go into, can they change their mind if a month later or are they making a commitment? Well, the I would say it depends. Um, and really, when they look at those models, we're trying to gather information that the models that they'll choose from doesn't mean the model they'll be in. They'll either have to commit to distance learning to start or in person. It's really going to depend on space availability. Um, and so if um, is, is um, just really the uh, if there's space available. So, so that will be what we look at. But we want there to be able to be those options to go back and forth. But I don't think we can say 100% that, hey, if you change your mind on this day, there, there may be some natural transitions times where we have to look at. Okay. Um, and there's just a lot of great information that came, and I know things are coming at us all fast and moving fast. And I know at the last board meeting, there was talk about a possible roadmap or some kind of something on the website that's just easy to digest for families and just wondering if that's in process. Yeah, we're, we're hoping that really prior to Thanksgiving break, we're able to kind of lay out what, what's happening really until we gather that information. And I know there are some people who have been very frustrated with that the survey hasn't already been out, but we heard loud and clear from our parent community that don't just ask us, are we coming back in person or not? Because there's so much more to make our decisions. So that's why when they see the, the, the complexity, I think of what's there, They'll understand why it takes a little bit more time. And then when we do have to translate, we have a, a large number of our community that aren't you know, native English speakers, and we need to get that information from all of them as well. Um, so once we gather that information, we are sitting down um, to probably have a pretty significant bargaining session with our teachers association on the 4th, the, the night after the election. And um, we pretty much set aside the whole day to hopefully hammer out some of those and then we can start really putting that roadmap together because we're going to need to communicate to families there may be some shifting of staffing that takes place just because you have yeah. uh, medically fragile staff or or other issues that we have to deal with nope that makes sense and i agree let's make the survey right because it's mm -hmm. going to be way more frustrating to do two or three surveys than just wait a little bit until all the information's there and i also want to say i appreciate all the time and detail because how we may understand what distance learning can encompass or what a model, what we think a model looks like. It's, I believe that there's some families that are thinking when we go back to in-person, that means it goes back to five days normal and that there isn't clarity for some on what that really does look like. So I appreciate the time into really explaining what does it really look like so folks have the information, make their choice. So thank you. Dr. McKibben. The, the, the information from the parents isn't needed as quickly as the other information. We'll be able to take a snapshot of that. But 
it, the reason it's so important to, to get that information in the long run from the parents is because if we have, there are some districts that are seeing in the secondary level, 40 to 50% of their students saying they're not coming back. That would change dramatically how many teachers we need to go into that model. Um, so we'll probably be chasing that information for quite some time and talking with other districts as well. That, that's gonna take us longer to get that information from families than it will be to potentially from our teaching staff that, that we have you know, contact with five days a week. They, they will be coming out um, centrally in a manner that the survey, the parents will enter information, which is really around their student ID number. So it will self-populate school grade, that type of information. Um, and so that if you have multiple students, then that's how you would, you know, you would um, take a survey for each of your students. Because we've actually had some parents that have said, you know, I have four kids. I'm not sure I'm sending all of them back in person. You know, I might send, I might see, keep some of them in distance learning um, because that's working better for them. Others I know need to get back into person. So they, they need to, it's, it's a family by family situation. Is there, um, it turned it's, off on. Again. it's on, it's on, it's on. It is, is it on? Okay. Uh, is there, uh, a cert are they customized in terms of, for example, with the uh, students with, with IEPs have a different survey than the others, or are they all, all pretty standard? They will be a, a for, we've already really surveyed our students are self-contained. It's the, the other students are, are that are in um, a, a gen ed class part of the time will be taking that survey. Okay. If, if a person was having difficulty answering the questions, uh, where would they go? Would, would, the, would they go to the central office? Would they go back to their school? Uh, the, the, the sites are going to end up, and as we've talked with um, some of our site leaders, they're really gonna have to be involved in this because we've said again and again, the majority of your community do not associate themselves with San Juan Unified School District. They associate themselves with the school they send their student to. Um, they, send their, they, they associate themselves with the teacher they have. So the schools are, are going to be really a big player in helping gather that information. For so us. it will be the schools that will get the data on who has responded and who hasn't. And, and they will be, uh, if you will, bird dogging the, those that don't respond. Yeah, the data will be able to be viewed by at both the district and site level. And, and I know for some of the things related to attendance, we had talked about using uh, some of the people uh, that currently are not doing other things to to uh, go out to, to the homes and, and, and could they are they going to be involved in survey collection and that sort of thing? Yes. Okay. That, uh, and and you're expecting 100 percent, not whatever. Oh, uh, that's that's wishful thinking. But <laughs> the, we we hope as as many as we ultimately. Folks are going to have to let us know whether they're returning or not. I don't know that I've spoken with any district that's gotten a hundred percent of their of them back. So we're gonna we're gonna do the best we can to get as many as we can back. And we assume that the people that don't return it aren't coming. Is that basically? Uh, no, some of them will show up on the first day they're open again. Okay. So it, it depends. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kern, for that report. And I just, I think in general, a lot of folks have to some extent survey fatigue, but I do hope for a large response right there. It's definitely important for planning purposes. Um, but as we have all calendar year, we will stand ready to, um, you know, pivot as much as needed and um, be ready to, to serve our, our children. So thank you very much for the comprehensive report. With that, we are now at item E7, and there are no closed session actions to report at this time. So we are at item F, visitor comments. Mr. Allen, will you please give instructions to those in attendance via Zoom on how they can raise their hand if they would like to offer public comment at this time? I would be happy to, President Viasquez. And of course, if you're watching tonight on YouTube, you can submit your comment via the form found at www.sanjuan.edu slash board meeting. If you've joined us on the Zoom call here today and would like to offer a comment on an item that is not on tonight's agenda, 
now would be the time to do so. If you'd like to offer a comment on an item that is on tonight's agenda, we would ask that you hold that comment for that agenda item and you will have an opportunity to offer a comment at that time. If you would like to offer a comment on an item that is not on tonight's agenda, you would do so by raising your hand. You can do that by clicking the raise hand button found at the bottom of your screen on a mobile device, the bottom of the attendees list on a desktop client, or if you've dialed into the Zoom call tonight, pressing star nine on your telephone keypad. And we do have five uh, who have joined us here on the Zoom meeting so far who would like to offer a comment. And we will start with our first comment from uh, Carrie. Carrie, you will have two minutes. As a parent, I feel you need to be more transparent about your plans for reopening school and requirements of PPE for students. On July 17th, 2020, Governor Gavin Newsom laid out a pandemic plan for learning and safe schools. Students in second grade and below are strongly encouraged to wear a face covering. Do you plan to honor this if I send my second grader to school? Will he be allowed to attend without a mask? Why are you promoting a mask and not face shields so the kids can see each other's emotions? What is your plan for special ed kids who cannot wear one or would have a hard time keeping them on? Or those who have a note from a doctor saying they are medically exempt? Why are you guys not focusing on also getting kids with IEPs back who are severely struggling and having to do certain things like speech therapy over Zoom when they would benefit more from in-person. It's also, we would like to know why you are keeping our kids out of school for an extra six weeks that they could have in-person instruction when there's no clear reason to continue to keep them out. And it would be more beneficial to get those kids struggling back sooner rather than later. Thank you, Carrie. And actually, while Mr. Allen brings up the rest of the participants for general visitor comment, I did forget one um, component that I usually offer as a reminder. Um, I'd like to remind the public that comments are limited to two minutes. The clock on the screen counts down the time. Under the Ralph M. Brown Act, the board is not allowed to comment on items that are not on the agenda, so we are not ignoring your comments. We just can't respond to any individual comments. The superintendent can refer items to staff who can follow up with you. I usually say that at the outset of visitor comments. Uh, Mr. Allen, are, do we have our next speaker ready? We do, and I apologize, uh, President Viasquez. I think I actually jumped ahead of you there. I don't think you actually forgot that, so I apologize. Okay. Our, next, our next speaker will be Elizabeth Allen. You have two minutes. Good evening, Governing Board members and Superintendent Kern. As a parent of two boys, a fifth and eighth grader who attend San Juan schools and as an elementary teacher in this district, I sincerely thank you for waiting to open until January. I appreciate that you allow science and local infection rates to guide your decisions. There is still a lot that's unknown about COVID-19 and the long-term health effects it has on one's body. We recognize that county and state recommendations are constantly evolving and changing as um, is knowledge about this virus. We are deeply grateful that you continue to monitor those changes and adjust course as necessary. For our family, there are three things that have remained constant amid these changes. First is that we don't wanna contract this virus and our daily actions reflect that wish. We mask up, we avoid going out in public, we limit our interactions with others and we wash our hands thoroughly. The second is that the longer we can delay the likelihood of becoming infected, the better the outcomes will be for us. I appreciate that all of our hard work to be safe isn't being brushed aside with a hasty return to school and work. We understand that with a return to school, we are increasing our chances of contracting COVID. It means we will no longer be as safe as we are now. The third is that this is all temporary. We know that any discomfort or challenges we face can be overcome with patience and understanding. And the sacrifices we're making today are for a better, safer tomorrow. So thank you again for putting our health and safety first. 
I'm optimistic you'll continue to be guided by sound science and best practices. Thank you again. Thank you for that comment. And our next speaker will be D Fitz. Thank you. Oh, there, now it's reset. Okay. Um, I appreciate that you're talking about getting back to school in January, but there is still no agreement with the teachers union. It is clear to me now and to many other people that the teachers union runs the district. You are making this promise to all of us. I am very concerned about the psychological repercussions that are going to happen if the rug gets pulled out from under us and we do not return to school in January. It's very concerning to me that you don't have your ducks in a row. You are allowing certain kids back, which is, that's great, good for them. We certainly need to get kids back. But I'm very concerned with the direction that you're taking this now when you don't have an agreement with the teachers union. Um, so things have already happened. Kids have already been upset. I'm glad for the parent who just spoke, who is happy keeping her kids home. Um, there's a lot of kids who are not happy. Uh, it needs to be fixed. And to have you saying this and then pulling the rug out from under us at the last minute before we return from spring break um, is very, very concerning to me. Um, I am glad that the Del Campo student government folks are having an awesome time in distance learning. I'm glad they want to continue. This is not the case for most kids. Student government kids already typically have good grades and a large pool of friends. This is not the case for many of our kids. They do need to be back in school sooner rather than later. Um, there's no reason for them to still be out and your maintenance and operations said everything's ready to go. So I appreciate all the work you're doing. I certainly hope that we will return at the very least in January. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Mr. Juan Aninez. Uh, good evening, can you hear me? We can. Great, thank you, Mr. Allen. Um, uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to again urge you to discard at large board elections and implement by district elections. In March, you passed a resolution to implement by district elections through early October, the San Juan website stated that you intended to do so by this November. Your inaction enabled three incumbent members to run for re-election under the unfair winner-take-all system. The system enabled these incumbents to receive over 57,000 from local education special interest groups. Is it any wonder why this board votes in unison almost without fail? By neglecting to implement by district elections, you needlessly cost the district at least 100,000. Legal action against the district promises to be costly. It is unconscionable to incur such costs at this time. You have hidden behind the COVID pandemic long enough. In the last several months, Folsom Cordova chose democracy and moved ahead with implementing by district elections set for this November. San Juan is one of the largest districts in California that does not have by district elections and does not have seven members. Our most diverse and vulnerable areas do not have board representation. I strongly urge you to implement by district elections for the West Arden Arcade and Citrus Heights areas this spring. The remainder of the district seats can be filled in subsequent elections at very low cost to the district. Please know, concerned and motivated voters will continue to advocate for by district elections until our goal is achieved. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, sir. And our next comment will be from Lindsay Tatishi. And I apologize for that name if I mispronounced it. Thank you. Um, I am, like Ms. Allen, a parent and a teacher in this district. Um, but my focus tonight is more from my parent scope. Um, Mr. Kern said that he was going to be sending a survey out um, at some time, I believe at the end of this week, um, and was hoping to get responses from all parents as to whether they were planning 
on having students return either in the hybrid model or remaining in distance learning. My concern as a parent is how am I supposed to choose which model is best for me if I don't know what model the school is gonna be implementing. It sounds like at the elementary school, they're looking at two models. I know at the middle and high schools, they're looking at three models. So how do I decide um, if I want to send my student back or not, if I don't know what model is being implemented? Um, I have questions about what are gonna be the start times and end times. Um, a lot of what I've heard is that lunch is gonna be a grab and go to get students off campus. What about students in the classroom? Are they gonna be wearing masks? Um, how is this gonna implement or change what teachers my students have if they choose to remain in distance learning? Are they gonna get a whole new class with a brand new teacher? Because that's gonna be more detrimental to them than going twice a week, even though that's not something that my family is looking at. I also worry about what happens before school and after school with supervision. I know now as a teacher that we have some students who get to class um, and to campus an hour before school starts and sometimes they're staying two to three hours after school ends. So how are we going to ensure that that isn't going to continue happening? When students get to school, are there gonna be areas where they can take off their masks? Um, because three hours in a mask is a long period of time, especially for elementary and middle school students. So my hope is that this information will be included within the survey and perhaps the survey deciding whether we are gonna stay at home or if we are gonna choose hybrid will um, come secondary. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next comment will be from Magali Kincaid. Good evening, my name is Magali Kincaid and I'm a parent and equity champion asking the San Juan Unified School District to do the democratic thing and hold elections of our trustee board members by area, also known as neighborhood elections and increase the board seats from five to seven. The district has been too comfortable with the segregation and the inequities that plague the district which continue to widen the educational gaps many times by zip code. It is time our most vulnerable neighbors, students, and community members have representatives that understand their needs. And it's time we have neighborhood elections and seven board members for one of the largest districts in California. The time is to act is now before the district costs our communities more money. And I encourage all of the parents on the line to research neighborhood elections and urge the board and the school district to move swiftly to enact both of these changes. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next comment will be from Louisa Burke. Hello. I would like to start off by asking, what is the price of our children's mental, emotional, and educational wellness? For three members of this board, it is respectively quantified as $7,953, $7,060, and $16,233, as documented by publicnetfile.com, as these are the amounts of campaign contributions made by the San Juan Teachers Association and the California School Employees Association to their re-election campaigns. These organizations have made their agenda to keep students at home, isolated from their peers and their faces in front of a screen as long as possible, crystal clear. With Sacramento County in the red zone, which allows for students to return to campus, this leadership team continues to bow to the demands of the unions and not to act in the best interest of the students or at the desires of many of the taxpayers. In spite of the $37 million as reported by edsource.org that was granted to this district through the CARES Act, which is approximately $650,000 per school, this board continues to drag out the students return to campus. As it has been reported by numerous organizations that children are not identified as a group who are adversely impacted as a whole by COVID and are not major transmitters of the disease. Article after article and study after study confirm the impact of quarantine, isolation, and distance learning as far more detrimental to students than the risks presented to them by COVID-19. Just check out npr.org from 1021. The risks of returning to school are exaggerated. The New York Times from October 23rd, children in school are unlikely to fuel COVID surges. And California Globe 
1023, three of four students are regressing academically in distance learning. While we haven't received the long awaited survey we've been promised and promised, I urge everyone to complete the ultimate survey at the ballot box a week from today. Thank you for your comment. Our next comment is from a user with name return to in-person learning. Hi, I actually wanted to address one of the learning models that was presented at the last board meeting where students would return to school for two days a week and do asynchronous learning the rest of the week. Um, SB 98 that was passed by Governor Newsom over the summer um, gave some very specific guidelines with regards to distance learning or as the district wants to call it asynchronous. It states in there um, under the guidelines that kids are to have daily live interaction with their teachers and peers. So for my two young elementary school age children, going three days without seeing a teacher or even two days without seeing a teacher or their peers is absolutely unacceptable. And it would go against the guidelines of SB 98, which would cause San Juan Unified School District to be out of compliance with that. So I highly urge Superintendent Kern and the board members to think about that before you pass any kind of learning model that would only be allowed two days of learning with the teacher. Um, I also encourage parents to vote. The three board members that are up for re-election are highly, highly um, wanted by the, dis the teachers union because of their willingness to cave into them. San or Folsom Cordova, Elk Grove Unified, Natomas Unified, they've all been able to work with their teachers associations to get kids back in the classroom. San Juan Unified School District is the only one that has bowed down to the San Juan Teachers Association and allowed them to get what they want. If teachers don't wanna to return to the classroom and do their job, they don't need to. There's things called substitute teachers that would love to be in the classroom with our kids. So it's time to get back to in-person learning because that's what the law says. Districts are required to offer in-person learning for the 2020 to 2021 school year. And thank you for your comment. Our next comment is from Carrie Sternberg. Hi, so um, Moderate Severe is supposed to start on Monday, and Ms. Costa, I, I believe you mentioned that only 51% of the Mod Severe kids have opted to return to in-person learning, but I think it's really important that you understand, Ms. Costa, that I think primarily that's because we don't have enough uh, information to make that decision yet. We, as far as I understand, the district has not agreed on the COVID guidelines yet. And so we don't have those. We don't know what the classes look like. We don't know how many kids are in them. We don't know what happens when somebody tests positive. We really don't have any information to make the decision as to whether our kids can go back or not. Most of our kids or a lot of our kids are medically fragile. And so it's an important decision for us to make. And we need facts, we need information. We need to know what our day looks like. Um, considering school starting in several days, to not have that information is really, really tough. So please um, send us an email, make a phone call. Let us know what our classes look like. How many kids are in it? Are our one-on-ones coming back? Do we have our in-person services, PT, OT, speech? Do we have our teachers on board? Do we have nursing for the kids that need feeding? What does the day look like? It is hard for us to make that decision without knowing what our day entails. Please provide us with information prior to Monday on what the COVID guidelines look like so that we can make an educated decision on whether it's time to send our kids back or not. Thank you very much. And thank you for your comment. Our next comment will be from Brittany Yavrom. Yes, hi. As a parent of a student at Arden Middle and College and uh, Cottage Elementary and a teacher at Encina Preparatory High School, I can definitely appreciate the frustrations that are being shared by many of the parents regarding the reality and challenges that they're facing at home with distance learning and their concerns for their students 
uh, well-being. However, I would just like to share uh, my appreciation for the board's um, hesitation in coming back and their responsibility in consulting the science and making sure that teachers and students are coming into uh, in-person learning in the most safe and responsible way possible. Um, it is definitely something that as a teacher, we would like to see happen because we miss our students and we love teaching in person, but we also cherish our own lives and our own safety uh, and appreciate the pause that you're taking to make sure that it's done correctly and done in a way that is safe and secure for our students, uh, my children and myself. And thank you for your comment. Our next comment is from Riley. Uh, thank you. I'd first like to say uh, Riley's actually my daughter. Um, for some reason, I wasn't able to get the Zoom to pick up my name. So um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Shelby Marks. And as the parent of two kids in the San Juan Unified School District, I have witnessed a disastrous implementation of distance learning. My son is a senior in high school and what should have been an exciting year for him has now become a school year he would soon like to forget. He will never get this year back and it angers me to no end that this momentous time in his life has been taken from him. A few months ago, a student at his school committed suicide. And although I don't personally know the circumstances of that child, it should serve as a sobering example of the consequences of this prolonged school shutdown. Children are suffering. They need social interaction with their peers and the reliable daily routine of attending school. It should be no surprise that depression, suicide, and drug abuse are on the rise for kids. Many of these cases are preventable by just allowing kids back to school and living some sense of normalcy. My daughter is in second grade and was struggling academically before the shutdown and is now, I believe, a whole grade level behind. Learning via Zoom and other online sources is not productive and no distance learning program will ever be good enough to replace in-person learning. Teachers are essential workers and we need to start treating them as such. By saying they are not essential is downplaying the importance of education and the future of our youth. If science was truly being followed, we would not keep kids and teachers out of the classroom for a virus that as of today, per the CDC website, has a 97% recovery rate. Yes, we should protect those that are at risk, but the majority of teachers and kids don't fall into that category. I've, I've spent the past seven months respecting the feelings of those who want to take every precaution imaginable to shield themselves from this virus. They should be able to continue distance learning if that's how they see fit to live, but it is way past due for us who want our rights respected. We as parents deserve the right to choose to send our kids back to school. We know what's best for them and no politically driven teachers union or school board should have this much power to choose the path for our children. And thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Missy uh, Badlayan. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Uh, yes, hi. Um, I'm a mother of three children in the district and um, I just wanted to let you guys know that I feel for you having to make all these tough decisions. I know it's not an easy one. There's a lot of things to consider, whether for teachers, staff, and children and all their families. This is a very unprecedented time with the virus. And I just want to say thank you for all that you guys are doing. I've had up and down uh, experience with the district learning, but overall, it has been really good. Um, my kids' schools, their staff is amazing. They do everything they can to include the kids, not just academically, but socially. They set up extra tutorial times. And... Um, I just think I understand it's a really hard decision on returning to school or whatnot, and everybody should have their decision, uh, their choice. But uh, I just want to want to let you know how much we appreciate you and how much you guys are doing to make this uh, giving some form of education during this unprecedented time. Uh, the teachers and staff at my kids' school at Whitney and Churchill have been amazing. I've been able to contact them after school hours if I have any issues. And we've worked together to 
uh, together to make this uh, a better experience. And thank you for all that you really uh, you do to make this possible. And thank you for your comment. That is the final comment we have uh, on Zoom. Uh, President Viasquez, I do have eight written comments that were submitted, if you would care for me to read them. Please go ahead and read them, Mr. Allen. Our first comment uh, was submitted uh, without a name. It reads, attorney statement. This district recently temporarily removed a committee member. In doing so, its conduct has been legally questionable. In reviewing this legal matter, I found potential liability pertaining to infringement of constitutionally protected freedom of speech, possible violation of whistleblower statutes, and defamation. I'm aware of how the district has conducted its investigation pertaining to this individual and have found the investigation was conducted improperly. Rather than recognizing this liability, the district tonight has again doubled down on its defamation efforts by singling out this committee member publicly in the meeting packets rationale. This statement was widely broadcast online prior to proper and unbiased investigation further exposing the district to legal liability. This is negligent defamation. The individual deserves a public apology for all communications the district has sent out and a swift reinstatement to their parent elected committee position. The social media and conduct policy agenda item is obviously a belated attempt to create post hoc real rationalizations to further defame and discredit the committee member. Not only was nothing done wrong, the complete evidence of which was already been presented to you. Our next comment is from Damaris Canton, who writes, SJUSD is the 10th largest in California. It is, the, it is larger than Sacramento City, which has seven board trustees and trustees who represent neighborhood communities. Our local neighborhoods need to have trustees that parents can talk to, trustees that our parents know, trustees that are accessible because they live in the neighborhoods they represent, trustees that visit their local schools and know and are known to our families on a first name basis. That is the way for trustees to really know the problems that these parents see and our students experience every day. We need trustees that know the parents and students, not just the administrators. We need seven trustees in this large district. Our next comment is from Amy Kasuni. She writes, good evening. I hope the proposed discussion pertaining to social media applies to all employees, officials, and volunteers. If so, I commend you for engaging in this conversation. However, the proposed code of conduct singling out committee members gives rise to concern. A more complete discussion would address how the board could enact protective measures for committee members in an effort to guard against abuse of such a policy. The district's LCAP committee members serve you in an effort to close the student achievement gap. To make committee volunteer positions more difficult by subjecting them to public attacks against their character, as has recently been the case, is unfortunate. To enact, to enact code of conduct policies that may give rise to additional attacks of this nature is cause for concern. Interfering with committee advocacy for protected classes of students by holding committee members to inequitable standards, investigations, and new potentially arbitrarily enforced codes of conduct without measures to protect against abuse of such policies indirectly discriminates against students of protected classes by making advocacy for these students more difficult. Finally, I urge the board to protect the district from the exorbitant litigation fees it faces due to its non-compliance with the law, including but not limited to the CVRA. Please settle all matters quickly, seeing that funds are not spent, seeing that funds are spent on education, not litigation. Our next comment is from Carolina Flores, who writes to SJUSD School Board and Superintendent, I am stunned and shocked at your failure to correct your website in order to set up your board for single district elections in 2020. You have pushed through your at-large elections contrary to the agreement with us to make this change for single district in 2020 is fraud. This omission to the voters is lying and you spent an inordinate amount of money, $100,000 to elect yourselves in an at-large election contrary to your agreement with us to implement single district elections in 2020. Your clear attempt to cover up your deficiencies serving our Latino community and people of color will not be ignored. You have forged another year of blatant violations of our voting rights, another year of mis construed service and broken promises to the Latino community, a year lost to the low income and people of color community. In 2020, your blatant disregard for our CVRA request for equal representation by a seven member board is an overt act of defiance against the public good and the public trust. In your actions, you have cost all of us a lost year of providing parity for in educational funding for impoverished schools like Encina High School. 
You have continued to damage each and every student in the impoverished schools and hindered their achievement towards fair and, e and equal quality education in the San Juan Unified School District. I await your response through Scott Rafferty, Attorney at Law, CVRA. Our next comment is from Christian Pompa, who writes, the meeting for today is listed on the website homepage as October 28th, 2020, and not today, October 27th, 2020, actually when the meeting is being held. Either it was a mistake or you would like to keep parents unaware and not participating, listening to what is going on and try to keep the parents oblivious and quiet. Please know that there are those of us parents who are watching. This needs to be corrected an apology needs to be issued. Thank you. The next comment is from Emily Ferris who writes, have you started planning for full time five days a week at school, all students? If so, will there be a list of milestones and progress provided to parents, community members, and when will we see that list? If not, why not? Our next comment is from Jennifer Pierce who writes, as both an educator and parent in the district, I would like to thank the board for their responsible and thoughtful plan for reopening on January 5th. I'm comforted in the thought that both students and teacher well-being is at the forefront of your minds during this unprecedented time. I felt it was wholly unfair and unkind the way some community members and parents responded to the news that there, we would be reopening on January 5th. I have seen a few districts create a hasty plan to reopen and the response by families that are included has been overwhelmingly negative. There have been COVID positive clusters, teachers and students, and students and parents are both complaining that students now have far less time with direct instruction from their teachers because of the hybrid model. My daughter is a high school senior and my stepdaughter graduated last year. This has been a dis disappointing for them, but because they are well-rounded, positive people, they know this is not the end of the world. They really, they were really sad about prom, all of the extracurriculars and the normal end of high school moments, but they know there is far more to life than this brief and unusual time. Again, thank you for your diligence, your thoughtfulness and your grace. Our next comment is from Griffin Long who writes, there are a lot of difficulties in these extraordinary times in balancing the needs for parents, kids, and teacher staff. With PPE, de-escalation training, distance options, food distribution, and constant reevaluation, it seems that you are walking this balance thoughtfully and with the best interests of everyone in mind. And our final submitted comment, give me one moment, comes from Ashley C who writes, what about IAs? Feels kind, kind of like we are disposable. If we don't feel safe or have kids of our own to return school, we are either told to take sick leave or suck it up pretty much. We should have the same options that teachers do. There are a lot of IAs that do just as much work as the teachers and sometimes more. Some of the principals and teachers seem to not care that our jobs are on the line. We are also bounced around, which I feel isn't beneficial to connect with the kids and hold a connection with them. Are there options for us besides having to go to our union? And that is our final public comment at this time, President Viasquez. Thank you, Mr. Allen. And just for my colleagues, I will just state, I was slightly confused. Typically the ones that come in before six, we consider read and the ones that come are written and submitted after six, we go ahead and, and read and so, um, that being said, it's our primary responsibility to, to listen to the public. And so we definitely fulfilled that role today. Thank you, Mr. Allen, for reading them as well. Um, with that, we are at item G, the consent calendar. Uh, do we, Mr. Allen, do we have any public comments for items that are on the consent calendar? We have had no public comments submitted for items that are on the consent calendar uh, via the form. If there's anybody with us on the Zoom call who would like to offer a comment on a consent item, uh, you may do so now by raising your hand. And I see one raised hand, again, reminding you that this is for a comment for an item that is on the consent agenda. With that, I will start comment with uh, D Fitz. One moment, uh, Ms. Fitz. when you are ready. I am not quite sure uh, what your consent calendar is um, specifically. I am still trying to pour through the hundred and roughly 50 pages of the board packet. Um, the only thing that I wanted to speak to is your consent 
to the new equity. Um, I think it's number 145. Um, if I'm speaking in the wrong place, just please let me know. Um, that would be under uh, business item three, business which will items. come up a little bit later. Thank you. I will wait until then. No problem. Thank you. Do any board members wish to remove any items from the consent calendar? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve items G1 through G6? So moved. It's been moved by Ms. Creason. Is there a second? And seconded by Dr. McKibben. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. With that, we are at item I1, updated update on independent study in TK8 homeschool. Mr. Messer, please begin when you are ready. Okay, let's get this started. Wait. One second. All right. Do you guys see my screen? Are we good to go? We can see your screen and we can hear you, Mr. Messer. Please go ahead when you are ready. Good evening, President Viasquez, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. Uh, the purpose of this report is to update the board on the district district's current independent study and TK-8 homeschool programs. For the opening of the 2021 school year, families were given the option to enroll their students in independent study or homeschool as an alternative to distance learning. As a result, this report will detail the current structures and practices in both programs, along with current enrollment patterns and program modifications. I'm here tonight with Dominic Cavello, uh, Principal David Levis from the Alternative Learning Center, uh, Sandra Petoric, Administrator of the Homeschool Program, and practitioners uh, Frith Gladys from El Sereno and Cami Cordell from the Homeschool Program to update you on these programs tonight. And then we're going to start with uh, Principal Levis from uh, the Alternative Learning Center in the Homeschool. Mr. Levis, are you ready? I am. Can you hear me okay? Yep. I can hear you. Good evening, El Sereno Independent Study has served our community for over 30 years, originally designed for child actors, semi-professional student athletes, and students who needed a more flexible schedule for learning. Over the past several years, we have averaged over the course of the year around 230 students at any one time. There's always been a constant flow of students in and out of independent study. We have historically served mostly students living northeast of Madison and Fair Oaks, more recently, many students who have come to us have been more socially fragile athletes, models, and students who need flexibility and supporting family needs. This year, we will still this year we are still serving those students, but have increased in size dramatically. Over our, our current enrollment is around 400 students. Of those, approximately 275 students have come to us from traditional educational systems, uh, but they're looking for more flexibility in their day. The largest number of students come from Bella Vista High School, which accounts for 39% of the students currently, um, but we are represented by all of, this, uh, all of the sc uh, schools. Um, the least represented schools are probably San Juan and Encina High Schools. These students have come to us for a range of reasons and are a mix of honor students to students who need some minor credit recovery. It allows them to be able to express their desire to have flexibility in their day so they can support their families, uh, many who need to be supporting other students who are in distance learning or are working. If you can go to slide two. Um, our past practice uh, essentially was connected with a master teacher. Um, a student would meet once a week, uh, drop in support, and they would meet in person. Uh, students would come you know, multiple times during the week, maybe ad hoc to be able to get support from teachers. Uh, we had a dedicated math lab and they would come in and, and drop in and had a, a dedicated math teacher. With our current practice, we are still working with a single master teacher. We have been able to add over last year and this year a physics teacher. And uh, over the course of the beginning of this year, we've been able to offer uh, language support for both Spanish and French. We are working in a, a, an auxiliary kind of system. Uh, for some of our areas that need more subject matter specific uh, 
areas around like biology and physics, uh, French and Spanish. Um, and we have transitioned to the use of APEX. APEX is an online uh, curriculum that allows students to be able to have their needs met directly. Um, and it also allows for more um, direct support and instruction. Uh, and it has a, additional tools that allow students to be able to learn if they uh, may need language support uh, in some of those areas. Uh, we are offering um, up to, uh, all the way up to pre-calculus. Um, and we do have, we've added an additional math teacher that allows us to be able to run a math lab from one to four every single day. Um, in the past, uh, we have worked with students in different areas as they need to be able to uh, either make up credit or have specific uh, classes that they need to have. Um, typically, students are assigned about 20 hours worth of work a week at minimum for attendance purposes. Um, and that would that allows students to be able to work through their classes that they need. And oftentimes they'll finish one class, go on to the next class, finish a class, go on to the next class. Uh, many students are also, uh, that have come to us in this new system are taking a few classes at their homeschool and they're still considered to be their homeschool students. And we just are uh, assisting them in the sense that uh, we, we use our teachers at El Cerrito, but they still have rights and access to their homeschool. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, so you can see a drastic change in our overall student population uh, over the course of the last couple of years uh, between 207, uh, same time frame, 161, and then currently we're about 399. Um, the thing I want to point out is as we look at the number of seniors, uh, we have a large number of seniors, about half of our school right now are seniors. Uh, many of those students uh, come from either block school, traditional school, and are working towards graduation at this time. The number of IEP students, the number of 504 students is also doubled. Um, and so we are providing support for all, uh, all types of students that they come in there. Um, our making evento students, our homeless students has remained about the same uh, with a slight increase. And next, I would like to pass on to my fabulous teacher, uh, Miss Gladys. She has uh, joined us from Bella Vista High School and has been an early entry into transitioning to independent study this year. Hi, thank you for so much for having me tonight. Um, as Mr. Levis said, this is my first year at El Sereno. I spent one year at Bella Vista last year, but I am primarily from Del Campo. I spent uh, 20 years there, so I'm very familiar with the Block School program. And again, thank you for having me. Um, my transition going uh, into the independent study program has been far more challenging than I had anticipated. Um, I am very used to feeling very organized and on top of my career, and I feel like probably some of our students feel just flailing sometimes. I'm, I'm doing okay, but I definitely feel that pressure of learning a whole new learning platform and engaging with students only one day a week is, is very different for me. Um, I really counted on those face-to-face -face interactions, but unfortunately, given the current situation, I was given the opportunity to work independently and safely away from students. So I am very fortunate to have this opportunity. Um, and I see a lot of my students even, that have chosen this path. We, as Mr. Levis said, we've almost doubled in size. And I see so many of them struggling, um, trying to learn this information independently, as, especially the math and the language and the sciences. And we, I am spending a lot of hours trying to track kids down and get assignments from them. And, and they are struggling, uh, some of them. I know that this was a good option for many, many families and it is very successful for some of my students. I don't mean to make it sound like it's all bad. Uh, some of my more motivated, highly organized students are going through their courses very quickly. And in fact, many are able to graduate even early. Um, we do have a couple of kids that have transitioned out of block schools that where they may not have been on track to graduate on time are now able to graduate on time. So it is uh, very good for some students. Um, but again, just like any of these current situations, you have students that are struggling and really having a hard time comprehending, retaining, understanding how to learn on their own. Um, so as you guys make decisions about what to do with you know, full-time distance learning, hybrid, all of that, 
Um, I would implore you to please have families make a commitment to whatever options they choose and make sure they are choosing what is best for their child. Um, I love doing the independent study program. It's working out well for me, but, but it is hard. It's been a definite challenge for me. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gladys. Next, I would like to introduce uh, Sandy Batoric, who is the administrator of the homeschool program. And see, Sandy, let me know when to switch slides. Okay, thank you and good evening, everyone. My name is Sandy Butoric, Program Manager for Student Support Services. And the homeschool program is one of the programs that I, that I do oversee. So a little background on our program. The TK through eight homeschool launched in 2016-17 as a pilot alternative option to seat-based instruction. In this program, parents commit to planning lessons and providing four to six hours of daily instruction with support from a credentialed advisory teacher. Now this credential advisory teacher meets regularly with parents and students to review student work and monitor progress with the number of meetings based on need, but minimally one time a month. The advisory teacher caseload is 25 students and up to 28 when needed due to increased enrollment for short periods. The homeschool program offers a menu of curriculum choices for parents to choose from based on grade level. And regarding our curriculum options, the student starts with an introductory work packet and corresponding novels for the first 20 days. The advisory teacher then works with the parent to order from these curriculum options. The options include district adopted curriculum from publishers such as Pearson, Houghton Mifflin, Harcourt, McGraw-Hill, National Geographic, Glencoe, and Inspire Science. In addition, online curriculum options are offered for students in our middle school grades. Student work samples are then collected regularly by the advisory teacher to determine attendance and grading. Slide. Now this chart shows the varying reasons for enrollment in our program. In 2016 through 2019, the typical homeschool family was either awaiting placement at a school of choice, perhaps on a wait list, they could have been in a non-compliant immunization status or spacing out their immunization schedule based on parent choice. They could have been in a voluntary short-term transfer from traditional school due to conflicts with peers. And then of course, we had families looking for a traditional homeschool alternative while still remaining within the district. In 2020-21, we're still supporting many families for the reasons stated earlier, but the vast majority have enrolled due to distance learning not working for the family. And as a safety net for these families, central enrollment is holding their spots at their original sites. Slide. In this chart, you can see the expansion of our homeschool program throughout the years. We began in 2016-17 with one advisory teacher and 43 students served. In 2017 through 2019, you can see the growth which led to a second advisory teacher in the 1819 school year. And finally, at 2021, we have 858 students and 37 teachers. Slide. This slide indicates the breakdown of our 858 students, as you can see. Clearly, the number is much heavier in our TK through second grades which is primarily due to the curriculum comfort level of parents. Slide. Now, beyond our overall growth, we have an increase in specific groups of students in our program as well. Regarding special education, those students with special needs must go through the IEP process in order to be placed into the program. In 2016 through 19, students with IEPs requesting enrollment in home school was about two to three per year. In 2021, 120 special education students have transferred into the home school program, of which 32 are mod severe and 91 are mild moderate. The program now includes four special education teachers as well, one moderate severe and three mild moderate. In terms of our English language learners, in 16 through 19, approximately one to two ELL students enrolled each year. In our 2020 to 21 school year, 25 ELL students are currently enrolled with consultative supports available through the EL departments. Slide. 
And now I'm going to turn it over to one of our lead advisory teachers, Cami Cordell, as a voice from the field. Hi there, and thank you for having me. My name is Cami Cordell. Over the past 25 years, I've had the privilege of working in the classroom in a charter school with adults to get their high school diploma and as a homeschool teacher. What I've learned the most about being a homeschool teacher is the relationship that develops because of the one-on-one -on -one homeschool interaction. It is an eye-opening experience that every single teacher should have the privilege to do. Being a homeschool teacher means families allow me into their homes, let me into their chaos, their struggle, their daily life. That certainly can be easy to do, and I consider it an honor they invite me in. Families choose to homeschool for a variety of reasons, but the goal is always the same, to better their child's education to the best of their ability. My job as a homeschool teacher is to support, guide, provide resources to listen and be a voice for the parent and the student. Let me give you a glimpse into my position as a homeschool teacher. Once we are assigned our students, we call to introduce ourselves and answer questions that the family has. For me, I place a tremendous amount of value on this call. I get a feel for the reasons they have chosen to be in homeschool, what circumstances they are coming from and how they feel their child learns best. It is a time to listen and to hear what is not being said. This phone call helps give me context for their reasons for homeschool and I can begin to think about the best way I can support them with their within their individual circumstance. My approach is completely empathetic. I want that gar parent, guardian, foster parent, grandparent, auntie, we have all of them, to know that I will do anything I can to make their job as a homeschool parent as successful as possible. That first phone call will set the tone and I take it very seriously. The parent, student, and I are a team and we must work together to provide the best learning environment. In the past, we were able to learn a lot about families just by meeting in their homes. Obviously, students come from all walks of life, but I make sure all my homeschool students receive an equal and enriching educational experience tailored to their specific needs. Since we can no longer meet in their homes, we meet with families over Zoom. It is more challenging to get a feel for the students from, for their home school environment. I have to be more intentional on the specific questions I ask in order to learn more about the student as well as the parent. The more I can directly engage, I find the better I'm able to support them and get them going. As our relationship builds and by the family trusting me more, they are more apt to feel a sense of confidence and claim ownership in their teaching ability for their child as well as navigate through the curriculum provided. With the, additional of, with the addition of 35 teachers in our program, most of them are brand new to homeschool. My teaching partner, Scout, and I were asked to be the lead teachers in this program. I am a teacher. I was hired as a teacher and I love being a teacher. This new role has certainly stretched us professionally. It has included many responsibilities that we were not familiar with as teachers, such as, working with 13 publishers to order student and teacher texts for the 865 students in nine different grade levels in all subject areas. We've had to work with technology to make sure every student has access to their portals and online curriculum. We've also had to work with the purchasing department to establish service agreements with over 30 businesses trying to set them up as vendors in our program. In addition, our main responsibility has been to train the new teachers. It is a whole new world for them and we have spent the last few months creating resources for them. Templates, guidelines, best practices, videos, compliance protocols and training them on our curriculum. You name it and we have tried it. To say the least, it has been a huge learning curve for all of them, but they are doing it. They have risen to that challenge. Being a homeschool teacher is my favorite. I love it and I look forward really to the return of normalcy. And I'm waiting for you guys to tell me when that will be. So I wanna thank you for giving me this opportunity to share about our K-8 homeschool program. I hope it was enlightening and gives you a clear picture of our program. Thank you, President Viasquez. Um, uh, we're open for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Messer and team for the presentation. Um, this is a quick note, we've had a little bit of a change of the guard. And so Ms. Bassanelli, when you're ready, um, can you please let me know if we have any public comments on this item? At this point, I, am, I have one comment, so just one moment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
And we have D fits. D, when you're ready to talk. Thank you. Um, I would have loved to hear more about El Sereno. Um, I am just really wondering what type of social opportunities they have for kids. Um, I, I had some understanding about what the program is, but um, I would really like to hear more about that. And um, so I am asking the board to um, have them return to another meeting or, you know, somehow put things out there that families can read a little more about their school because um, I'm still not quite clear on if it's just all online and they never see a teacher or, I mean, despite COVID. Um, so I would just like more information on them. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further public comments at this time? There are no more raised hands. Do any board members have questions or comments? We'll start with Mr. Hernandez. Ms. Costa. Mr. Messer, uh, I had the advantage of hearing this presentation with curriculum and standards, but one of the pieces that I was really interested in because I wasn't aware of this before is um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of our students being dual enrolled in independent study and with their former high school? So I would say there are adv the advantages, many advantages um, that were set up before uh, this year even started. So for example, if a, a student, high school student chose to go to El Sereno, that student, again, it's a independent study is a choice program. So they choose to go to El Sereno. But one benefit is that a student at El Sereno still has the opportunity to access athletic programs at their home school. That would be one advantage. Um, they also, students that transfer into El Sereno, being that independent study by law is a choice, they do have the option to move back to their uh, home school uh, based on their needs. So going into this year um, to enhance that, uh, those opportunities, I think an advantage is we kept our students um, enrolled almost in a, and, and Mr. Levis could probably give us the more detailed version, but basically we kept them on the books at their home school, even though they've come to El Sereno in the transfer process. So that if our students who have made their way to El Sereno uh, because of COVID or, or just situations, if they choose to move back into their home school uh, at any time this year, they can do so without having to re-enroll. There's no re-enrollment process. We basically created kind of a very smooth fluid in and out to really support the kids. So knowing that the students that were coming this year probably weren't as Mr. Levis described as some of those uh, students that typically have gone to El Sereno. Um, if they choose to go back, we can get them back. And I think that's a big advantage. And the students currently at El Sereno still have the opportunities to participate in their homeschool activities once the schools open as well. So, and disadvantages, I really, um, there's really the transition for some students having to learn to really work independently is probably as Ms. Frith described as the biggest struggle some kids are having, you know, in that part of it. Thank you. Mr. Levitz, this is a fortune telling question, but how many students do you anticipate will go back to their high schools on January 5th? So part of that uh, answer is the number of seniors that we have that uh, have come from block schools or traditional schools that are, uh, we're on track to graduate before they came to us um, and then only having to finish out the credits that they need to have. And so there'll be a, a, a good solid chunk of those students that should be finished before we get to the second semester. Um, that being said, I would say about half of the students uh, that requested independent study um, checked off the box that said if they return, you know, if, if in-person was an option for next semester, uh, would they want to return? And many of them did say yes. Um, as we are going through this year and, and 
with some families still not sure about what next semester looks like, um, that number may decrease if, as they become more confident in independent study. Um, it has taken some students a while to transition to independent study. There's a lot of real world uh, beyond high school skills and life management and time management that has had to take place for students to uh, overcome some of the challenges of working in an independent study structure. Um, and with students still needing to complete credits, uh, they, may, they may desire that second semester flexibility. And, and second semester is also a longer period of time physically, uh, which allows students to be able to, uh, to finish up classes that they may have not gotten uh, taken care of in the first semester. Thank you. And Ms. Petorek, I, I have to tell you my reaction of going from 72 students to 858 in one year. I just cannot imagine what that was like as an administrator and what that was like for your teachers as you transitioned. Do you anticipate on January 5th having some students transition back into classrooms or do you think the 858 students will stay with you? What's your best guess? Well, honestly, you know, based on many parent conversations that I've had, I, I do anticipate probably about a third of those will drop in the in the January month, with more actually to drop, I think, at the spring trimester. That's where I'm, I'm hearing that they feel probably the most safe. Um, but honestly, but I think that, you know, really half of the total enrollment will will end up through the end of the year, because I'm finding that a lot of families are kind of in their groove now. They're really getting this. And it, it is a real challenge to teach your own children, that's for sure. Um, so that's just, you know, again, that's a prediction. Uh, but I think overall the program will grow for 21-22 because there are a lot of families that are really enjoying it and they're, and they're sharing that with me as well. Well, congratulations to both schools. It really is an exciting program and I'm glad we had it to offer for our families. So thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Creason. So, thank you so much for the report. Um, I'm so happy that we were able to ramp up and just offer these programs so quickly, just as um, Ms. Costa stated before, you know, we're able to offer something and expand so quickly that is obviously well utilized. So I just wanna applaud everyone who was able to do that so quickly. Um, and I'm just wondering, cause I do hear loud and clear the lead teacher and it's all teachers, you know, really, and parents, everyone that's in this system that had to, you know, take on new different roles and do things that we maybe were not trained to do to get through this pandemic. So I do hear loud and clear that, you know, folks, uh, teachers and others are being asked to do more than just teach. And I just want to express my appreciation and a question that does not need to be answered right now, but I would love to learn more of how, more about how we're supporting our teachers uh, in that way, you know, to do the extra, to do the things you don't learn when you're going to school for teaching. Like, what are we doing to round out those managerial skills and everything that is coming with this new way of learning? Um, and again, I don't need an answer to that today, but just again, just very appreciative for all the balls that everyone's struggling um, to make it work for our kids. And just a note for the public, um, you know, we have a lot of great schools in our district and I wish we could do a really deep dive on every single one of them and talk about all the wonderful offerings in the boardroom, but we can't. And so I just want to encourage folks to visit their websites. All of our schools have websites. And if that doesn't answer your questions, contact them directly and learn more. Our schools, we see when in our district, we have so many schools are an open enrollment district. So when you learn about one school, you only learned about one school. Um, our schools have different offerings and I really do encourage you to learn more about, uh, about that. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Creason. Dr. McKibben. First of all, I wanted to uh, say uh, again, thank you to both programs. This district has a long tradition of being about choice and, and, and the kinds of adaptations that were made this year to try to accommodate that uh, by, by these schools as well as many others is very commendable. I did have one question for uh, uh, Ms. Gladys. Uh, Ms. Gladys, in your presentation, you talked about have the families uh, become more committed to the program that they were in. Can you uh, tell me 
kind of what you mean by that, what that might look like, and what the commitment uh, that you're hoping for might look like? Um, I, <clears throat> I think when parents are, you know, going to take this survey that Mr. Messer mentioned spend, sending out, that it really that the you all need to be very transparent with what each program is offering, whether that's hybrid, um, how many days a week is that? And, and the same thing for independent study, where the student and parent uh, really know how many hours it takes to get through the courses and that they need to have strong motivational and organizational skills so that they can stay on track. Um, I am finding that while I was fortunate enough to start at El Sereno at the beginning of the year, because of the influx of students that we've gotten over the last two and a half months, we've had to staff up with more personnel. And these newer teachers are being thrown in with almost no training to have to navigate uh, Apex and eDynamics and the El Sereno curriculum that's right out of Google Classroom. It's it's almost taking some of the kids that are coming over halfway through like a week to get transitioned in. And we're still trying to get the teachers transitioned in and training us. Um, we're, we're tough on ourselves. We want to do it right. We want to understand what we're doing and we want to have that control and, and organization. And we're still, still trying to learn how to be good at being independent study teachers. Uh, it's, it's making it hard for the kids too. And while about a little over half the staff at El Sereno, um, they've been there a long time. They know all the ins and outs and they know all the tricks and the, the ways to navigate and help students be successful. You know, you're hearing from a newbie over there and, and it's been really hard. So in talking to my other teacher friends that are new to El Sereno, we know how hard it is for us trying to learn a new curriculum um, and it's got to be tough for those kids, too, who already went from distance learning in the spring to maybe distance learning now in the fall at their home school. And it, it's just so new for them. So I, when families are making a decision about where to go, I would really like to see that be a commitment or, or, or let them know that they need to wait till a more um, appropriate time to transition over, I guess. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGiven. Are there any further qu questions at this time on this item? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and thank you all for your time. We really appreciate it. At this time, we are at item I2, Encina Middle School Development Update. Mr. Shumake, please begin when you are ready. All right, I just need to be made a host here so I can share. There we go. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to start my video. Oh. All right, well, good evening, President Biasquez, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. Uh, tonight, the superintendent has recommended that the board receive and provide feedback on our progress on the development of our new Encina Middle School. Joining me tonight are Shana Henry, our recently hired Encina Middle School principal, and Nina Mancina, our recently retired program specialist, who has continued her role of supporting Encina as we plan for our new middle school. We look forward to sharing our progress with you. Our agenda tonight will cover five specific aspects of our work, ranging from our continuous improvement lens to our 2020-2021 milestones and conclude with ample time for any questions the board may have. Our work with Encina continues to build upon our district work related to continuous improvement. In a nutshell, how do we listen to, learn from, and respond to the needs of students, practitioners, and our community members? As you recall, in the spring of 2018, with the upcoming Comprehensive School Improvement Identification, uh, CSI, we decided to take a different approach with Encina to support them. The concept of continuous improvement was introduced at the site, 
with the, agree with the agreement that Nina would postpone her retirement and spend the 2019-2020 school year embedded at Encina to explore, discover, learn, and plan for the future with the Encina staff. Our goal with this process was not to look at things from the top down, but to listen, learn, and build from the ground up. And but based on our findings from the past, take the time needed to make sure that the best decision was made before moving forward. Our work since that time has generated some significant input and learning, and I'm happy to share that at this time, our default decision-making stance is anchored in student, staff, and community voice. While listening to students, staff, and community voices, it became really apparent that senior district and teacher union leaders needed to be available to provide support, advice, guidance, and in general, really just remove barriers to success for our site level teams. This past year, we established our district sponsorship team with leaders from the Division of Teaching and Learning, Maintenance and Operations, Communications, Professional Learning and Innovation, and the San, the San Juan Teacher Association and site leaders. This team meets regularly with Roxanne, Shana, and Nina to discuss issues that the site and community need help in resolving. Uh, some examples of this team listening and facilitating action includes um, facilitating the creation of the new Encina Middle School, uh, actively recruiting and hiring a new middle school principal one year before the school opens, planning and assisting with facility improvement discussions, and helping resolve other issues as they arise. This slide on stakeholder engagement really reflects a 40,000 foot overview of some of the key engagement pieces since Mr. Messer's presentation to, to the board a year ago this month. You can find a much more detailed listing of uh, our engagement activities and a timeline in Appendix A of your board packet. I believe that the work has been, that has been done in this area at Encina is significant. And I, as I mentioned earlier, it's fundamental to what we are doing as we cr create our new middle school. At this time, Nina is going to provide you with some additional details related to our path, and Shana will conclude with providing you with an update on some of our recent work and milestones. Good evening. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Because the picture hasn't changed, so I don't know if I'm live or not. We can hear you great. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, good evening. I'm here tonight to provide you with an overview of the middle school design process for the 2020-21 school year. In support of the separation of the middle school from the high school in Encina, the leadership team established two working groups, one representing middle school and one representing high school. For the purposes of this presentation, I am going to focus on the work of the middle school design team. The middle school team consists of five certificated representatives and two administrative representatives. There is also one classified rep, one parent rep, and one community representative. Student representation is hard because it is often difficult for students to participate in after school meetings. In an effort to address this issue, each member of the team has identified a student who will serve as their guide throughout the process to ensure a constant influx of student voice. The path that is laid out on this slide is based on the work of the D School K-12 Lab at Stanford and the National Equity Process Project. The initial part of the process focused on using an equity lens to examine the interconnection between who we are, so the uh, piece that talks about noticing, and who we are designing for based on what we hear from students, parents, and other staff Team members then use this information to begin to define the authentic needs of students and their families. The next phase of the process <clears throat> is to take the information we have gathered, including relevant research, and the needs we have identified to create what I call game-changing prototypes. It is important to note that in this phase, we want to have multiple prototype, prototypes to test and be as divergent as possible. As you can see, we will stay in the cycle of creating, testing, and ideating for several months in order to get feedback from all voices necessary to help us modify our designs and develop our recommendations. This includes individual, small group, and community conversations. The final step of the process is to be reflective 
and ensure that we have fully engaged with, with and incorporated the ideas of students and the community in our design. Once approved, additional details will be fleshed out in the prototype in order to get ready for implementation in the 2021 and 22 school year. I now move on, pass it on to Dr. Shana Henry, uh, the interim, the new principal for middle school. Good evening, President Biasquez, board members, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. It's an honor to be here this evening and also to be a part of the San Juan team. Not only have I received a very warm welcome from everyone in the district, but each trustee has taken time to meet with me to not only share your love for our district and to offer your support through this process, but also to share your hopes and dreams for our new middle school and affirm your commitment to our scholars and community. I have worked in two other districts for the past 20 years, and I can honestly say I have yet to see all trustees make that kind of time. So thank you. Now it has been an interesting time to enter San Juan and begin the design work in the middle of a pandemic, but where there is a will, there is a way. Our incredible middle school design team have adjusted to the circumstances, and I'm very proud of the progress milestones to date and those to come. Like this road you see on this slide, we know there will be ups and downs, but we are clear on our ultimate destination. In addition to the design team work Nina has spoken to, part of our milestones include relationship and trust building with our scholars and community through this process. Since joining the team in July, I've spent time listening and learning. That included listening sessions with current staff, meeting with scholars, and our feeder elementary school leaders, all to help me learn the story of Encina, past, present, and hopeful future from those who know it the best. And despite the current distance, we are finding ways to make connections, gather input, and get our community excited for the new school. I have visited classrooms to introduce myself to every middle schooler and share how they can include their voice in the process. We recently held an ice cream drive through social for our middle school scholars and families. And all scholars and stakeholders have been invited to join me on Instagram to create a transparent behind the scenes view of our design work and provide their input along the way. Moving forward, our middle school design team will be hard at work for the next milestones to come. Some of our big rocks include identifying our school vision and instructional framework, working closely with the facilities team to plan for the 21-22 school year transition and beyond while ensuring voice from our staff and community, collaborating with our HR department and identifying staff for the new school, connecting with our district office and school community for the school naming process, and providing ongoing parent input and information sessions. On behalf of our design team, we look forward to providing more updates along the way. Thank you again for letting us share our progress on the development of our new Encina Middle School. At this time, we would be happy to answer any questions the board may have. Thank you very much for the presentation and the update. Um, first, we will go to Ms. Bassanelli. Do we have any public comments on this item at this time? There is one hand raised, Rebecca Mackin. <laughs> Rebecca, you may unmute yourself. So I am a staff member at Encina and I just wanted to make sure that all of the community voices are being heard as well. I know there's been conversation about not separating the middle school from the high school and instead providing some type of um, barriers between spaces so that students don't interact with each other. However, with our current model, that's what is failing our kids right now. So is that going to be something that is going to be addressed and brought back to the community with um, the idea of not actually separating the two campuses? That is all. Thank you for joining us this evening. Ms. Bessinelli, are there any further public comments on this item? This time there are not. Okay, I'll turn it to my colleagues. Do any board members have questions or comments on this item? Mr. Hernandez? Um, I'd just like to welcome Dr. Henry and uh, it was very um, exciting to be able to meet with you and talk to you and hear of your vision. And uh, we look forward to the good things at Encina Middle School. Thank you for the report. Thank you. Ms. Costa. 
I echo Mr. Hernandez's comments. It was wonderful to talk with Dr. Henry and to hear her ideas and share thinking with her. So thank you for that. I do have some questions. When we look at the site-based design team, and thank you for spelling it out in this report uh, verbally tonight, the 10 student guides, what grade levels do they represent? And how did the, I would assume it's the administrator, the teachers, the parent and community member select those and classified employee member uh, how did they select those student guides? Can you give me more information about that? Sure, I think Nina, you're probably best equipped to answer that question. Can you tackle that? Yeah. So um, the primar primarily the student guides represent the middle school. Um, and there's uh, one teacher who has an additional guide who is also a high, a high school senior, just because we wanted to kind of get some, uh, a mix of information about their experience at Encina and how it prepared them for high school. So the way that the, each individual staff member identified the student guide was through students that they have a relationship with, um, that they already sort of have a connection to, because um, obviously, being in distance learning right now, that building of trust, that connection um, is a little harder to do. So it just helped for them to identify students that they already had a connection with. Um, I also, it's important to note that some of them couldn't decide on a single student, so they actually have more than one student um, as well. <laughs> well, and will this site-based uh, design team have input into the facility design? Because if there's one issue that I keep getting phone calls and emails about, it is how will the middle school and the high school be separated and how will they look and what will it, the design be? So is part of that decision the site design team or will they have input into that or is that a total staff and community decision? Yeah, Nina, I, I'll, I'll tackle that. I know Frank's on the line as well, um, but um, Frank, I'll let you chime in if you feel like I've missed something here. Um, but uh, Frank and his team have already met with the site leadership team and the redesign teams. They met with them in, uh, in September to talk about some options. Uh, Frank, his team, the architect, Rick and I are all meeting with the Encina staff, the entire staff tomorrow to talk about uh, facilities specifically. Um, and really the, um, the instructional model is gonna inform the plant design. So as this design team and the, and the faculty starts to narrow down what they want to be, that's gonna inform a lot of the design decisions. And so um, I can assure you that uh, there's gonna be ample voice um, from the community, from our students and from our uh, faculty as to what that's going to look like. And ultimately, as we know, uh, Frank and his team um, never disappoint. And I'm sure they won't in this case either. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Costa. Ms. Creason. I wanna first thank Nina for not retiring. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All of your efforts were just so great. And I, it was wonderful to be able to get to know you a little bit during the process and just learn how thoughtful you are. Um, how dedicated you are to student voice and taking the time and going the long road to really be so inclusive uh, to frame your recommendation. So I just want you to know it's really noticed and thanks for hanging, hanging around. And I also wanna echo my colleague um, recognition of how wonderful it was to get to know Dr. Henry. And I am looking forward to continuing to grow that relationship. I definitely think you're the right person for this position. It was wonderful to hear you know, your background and your dreams and hopes for the new school. So uh, just welcome again and happy that you're at the helm. Um, so about the building, I had assumed for, I, I had it in my mind for one reason or another that there was gonna be a new building going up. So do I now understand correctly that that's under discussion of how that's gonna play out? Yeah, everything's in play at this point. Um, there's nothing, there's no decision has been made. And um, ultimately we may land on, um, a new structure or a new facility on the campus. It, again, it's really gonna depend on the, uh, 
the instructional model that the site kind of drives us towards and then what you know how can that best be supported by the facility model I, can i I'll, let me add to that as well i think the other thing that we need to speak to is we have a limited number of um bond funds available and we have 64 schools and so we have to and frank and his team have to look at all of that as well and one of the things that even our bond oversight committee will say is you've, you've got a district that almost has too much square footage already. So adding square footage, we need to be smart. So whatever new buildings we add, how are we utilizing a, a site that in the Encina high school campus at one point that I think had 1500 students on it for just the high school. So we have to take all that into consideration in whatever they're doing with the redesign, but I think it really is important to reiterate to Jim because I had a conversation with a staff member, um, about one of the high school teachers as well about two or three weeks ago that even with a high school signature project out there, we kind of challenged them a number of years ago. What are the needs? What, you know, what is it based around? And they're not the only high school that struggled with that because we haven't done them at all of the schools. But that's, that's part of it that we've got to know that the program is driving what the needs of the facilities are. That's it. Dr. McKibben. Maybe a little closer to the mic. There you go. Okay. Um, talk about uh, voice. Uh, in, on slide five, you talked about the West End advisory uh, 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 role, and I wanted to know a little bit more about that. You talked a bit about some community events, and if you could give me some examples of some of the events that, that uh, where you got uh, uh, input uh, and feedback uh, about the plan and so forth. And finally, have uh, one of the things about it is we're trying to increase enrollment here. Have you talked to the uh, potential feeder schools about what they might like to see in this program too, in, in terms of uh, trying to make sure that you get a full spectrum of ideas and voice uh, on the, uh, the, this new uh, uh, school? Sure, I, um, Dr. McKibben, the, there's quite a bit of uh, detail on um, Appendix A too that might answer some of your questions, but I'll have Nina uh, talk to some of your specific questions related to the, the work that was done. And then um, Shana, if you don't mind jumping in and sharing some of the really neat work that you've done by reaching out to the uh, feeder programs. Nina, are you there to ch chime yeah, in? Yeah, I'm here. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, the work that I believe you're referring to, Dr. McKibben, is from last year, and we had an uh, advisory group that we brought together to take a look at some of the data that was collected and some of the work that was done by staff to make the recommendation with regards to separation of middle school and high school. Um, that group included um, actually feeder school principals as well as other middle school principals. There were uh, community members and uh, parents involved in that work. The uh, other thing that informed that work was we did do a thought exchange um, process last year. So we uh, gathered a lot of information from that uh, as well to help us think about what, we, what recommendation that they wanted to make to the board. Hopefully that answered your question. Okay, and Shana, would you mind sharing just some of the outreach that you've done in your time? I mean, obviously, it's a little difficult, like you said, in a pandemic, but paint a picture for them. Sure. So um, it's all been virtual, but we have been making connections. I have uh, specifically connected with the administration at uh, our three main feeder schools um, at least twice now to, one, get to know the community, and then also to seek their feedback on how we can uh, build some bridges with their parent community and with their staff as well, specifically around how to build some trust and relationships with bringing back parents that may have chosen to opt out of coming to the Encina program and what we can do to connect with them. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And um, Dr. Henry, glad we got a, a chance to uh, sit down and connect as well. Appreciate your leadership and excited about the things to, to come. Um, really appreciate the, um, the update. And I just want to maybe for, for Nina or Jim, I just, I know, you know, virtually it's a little bit difficult. And I know, I understand completely the desire to make sure that it's a site driven process, but I just want to, um, I want to make sure that we're still, um, you know, that the site staff feels supported to kind of make that decision in a way where we're continuing to to make progress. And I think I'm the the middle school and the high school probably less of a question, but I just think of things like the signature project, with, which Mr. Ken Fern bro brought up. Um, so you know, definitely we've covered quite a bit, but um, and I just want to ask the the question: How else can we help? <laughs> I think uh, you allowing us to present our work, to ask the type of questions that you are asking, to probe our thinking, it, it, it does help us inform where uh, where the board's at and what the priorities are. And and um, I think we're in a, in a good spot. And um, Ms. Fiasco, I can, I can assure you that that, that is a very uh, um, deep and thoughtful staff. Uh, they're not gonna let us do anything to them uh, and, and we're not approaching it from that lens. So I think, at the end, the end result, we're, there's going to be a lot of work done, and, and Nina has certainly, by her presence on the staff the last two years, has really created a very trusting environment. And we're, we're as our milestone road show, you know, we got some some hills and obstacles up ahead, but I'm I'm, I'm confident we've got the right team to do a really nice uh, end product here. Great, really appreciate all of the efforts, and actually, I think the specific topic has come up. Um, in other meetings, it just continues to be a significant point of interest to the board. So looking forward to future updates. Also want to thank Ms. Mancina for being pretty unsuccessful at retiring. Um, <laughs> try to keep it that, that way a little bit longer. Um, and look forward to future updates. Thank you very much for the report. With that, we are at item I-3, new board policy 0415 regarding equity. Dr. Calvin. Good evening once again, President Viasquez, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. You have before you tonight newly proposed equity board policy 0415. I am joined tonight by Director of Equity, Diana Marshall and Program Coordinator, Lori Vine, who are here to briefly outline the process involved in the development of this policy and to answer any questions that you may have. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Kern. Given the San Juan's work and dedication towards equity, it is recommended to approve board policy 0415 equity. The journey of this board policy is as follows. As we have shared with the board in August, stakeholders came together in June to discuss the needs of the community in our listening sessions called From Listening to Action. Our, communi our community communicated their needs and assisted in the development of the San Juan Unified Eight-Point Commitment to Educational Justice. At that same time, leaders of equity across the state have formed a collaborative, which we have been participants. We've learned, we learned in June that board policy 0415 is being approved more frequently across our state and is just one step that we can take in education to ad address the inequities that, that exist in our organizations. In July, the equity department met with legal and reviewed the CSBA recommendations around board policy 0415. We created a draft policy and then shared out to various groups for feedback and made edits through the process. This policy was reviewed by our equity liaisons, our equity community collaborative team. We advertised and presented this policy at, at a parent stakeholder as well as a staff stakeholder meeting in September. Finally, we um, asked the cabinet asked cabinet for review and feedback on September 28th. 
At this time, I'd like to turn this over to Lori Vine, and she will share how the board policy 0415 and the San Juan 8 point commitment are aligned. Good evening. As the district engages in our eight point commitment, educational justice, we believe it's necessary and affirming to have a policy such as this to support the work being done. In fact, the measures listed here are almost in direct alignment with the eight points with a few exceptions. For example, as you move down the list of measures within the policy, you can see that measure one aligns with commitment one, that of improving school climate and culture. Measure two aligns with commitment two, that of accountability for all and equity success indicators. Measure three and commitment three speak to increasing all stakeholder voice, as well as ensuring that we have strong collaborations with our community partners. Those measures that do not directly align are still in support of these commitments. Measure six is very data focused, but it does support the work being planned in commitment six around designing equity teams at our sites who would then assess the data this measure speaks to. Finally, measures eight and nine support the work being done in commitment eight, where we are focused on equitable access to schools, programs, and rigorous coursework. It is our belief that this policy and its alignment to our eight point commitment will help solidify the district's commitment to equity. At this time, we are available if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Marshall and Ms. Vine for that presentation. Um, before we head to public comment, I just want to remind our visitors that if you're joining us for comments, you can indicate that you would like to offer public comment by um, on the Zoom platform by using the raise your hand features and um, would like to remind the public that comments are subject to a two minute limit. We also ask that they be limited to the agenda item. Um, we are at item I3. I'll remind our visitors that there is also another visitor comment section that's available for general comment at item L. Ms. Bassanelli, do we have any public comments on this item? Are you ready for me to comment? for public comment. I cannot tell if I am unmuted or not. Ms. Fitz, we can hear you. Please begin your two minutes when you are ready. Great, thank you. Um, so some of these, I'm having a hard time reading through this, um, trying to gather some information. It's lacking some transparency here. Um, there's no dollar amounts connected to it. This sounds like some of these things are very expensive, involve hiring a whole new group of um, employees. I'm not seeing that attached here. I'm clicking on the links that are in the board packet and the links are not working. It's game something that I have to have special permission to be able to get to. So in order for me to thoroughly research this so that I can speak to it, I need full access. Um, that hasn't been given. So that's a little frustrating. Um, I am wondering who your stakeholders are, who exactly it was who gave input. That's not in here. Which groups did you go to? What parents did you go to? I'm not asking you to list their names, but what schools did you go to? Um, the eight point commitment, I'm a little confused as to whether, whether their commitments or measures, um, you're referring to them differently and there's nine of them. So um, if you have this posted here and I should be able to read it to make up my own mind and take action from there, I truly need you to be very transparent and fully disclose all the things that you have in here. So um, I will be emailing you to ask for all the information that's in these links. Thank you. Ms. Bassanelli, are there, is there any further public comment at this time? At this time, there is not. Thank you, Ms. Bassanelli. At this time, I'll turn it over to my- President Fiascas, we have just one more hand that just got raised. Okay, uh, just a quick reminder that public comments are submitted. Marina 
Hello. Um, <clears throat> I have spoken to uh, Diane Marshall about these uh, eight points and the social justice and how I think this was August 11th, this was introduced. Um, and to me, it seems to be much more of a, a reactionary uh, way of handling things that's going on outside of the school, outside of our school community. And now it's affecting how teachers are teaching and the language that teachers are being taught to use uh, that we are, uh, you know, if, if we are white, we need to talk differently to, to people because we're white and we're privileged. Um, the fact that teachers have to go voluntarily to learn social justice, that it's not a requirement, yet they can teach it to our children. Um, and so it's almost as if they have a freedom to teach any way they want, and there is nobody really keeping an eye on what's happening in our schools. And to me, that's a very, very scary line that that's being allowed to happen. And it has affected me personally. And I know it's affected thousands of other families. And I'm talking about not just the San Juan district, all of California. And I know a lot of people who are literally leaving California because of these uh, quick rushed reasoning to support this fanatical social justice and the new language that you're using to describe white people, which is racist. Sorry. Ms. Bassanelli, is there any further public comment at this time? At this time, there is not. Okay, I will now turn it to my colleagues for questions and comments. Mr. Hernandez. I just want to uh, thank the equity department for their work. It's been a long, um, it's been a, a long process to get to where we are with this eight point and I appreciate their efforts. But I just want to thank um, uh, Dana Marshall and there was an email sent to the board from a college student and had a laundry list of questions about our equity department and more importantly, the eight point um, commitment. And she responded uh, by each question and that piece, I printed it and I kept it in my notes because for me it was the best information that, uh, that I have that refers to you know, the, the eight point commitment. And um, we should maybe share that, but I'm telling you that I just appreciate that because it helped educate me even more and uh, so thank you for that response and thank you for letting us see that. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Ms. Costa. And thank you to Diana Marshall and to Lori Vine and the team that has worked tirelessly on this uh, for several years, not just this summer. Uh, the group that worked this summer included parents, community members, students, classified employees, teachers, administrators, uh, board members, central office, district office staff. And the conversations were heart-wrenching in some cases when people described their experiences and described what it meant to be part of a community that accepted all individuals within the community. I read this policy and thought this is comprehensive. It's well thought out. It captures the thinking I've heard since the 70s in San Juan and goes beyond the work that's been done before. Uh, it really brings the eight point commitment into clear board policy. I especially like the use of stakeholder voice, the access to advanced placement and CTE programs, uh, the extracurricular activities for all, 
hiring and retaining a diverse staff. And what I thought was really important in this policy was including the allocation of budget, which will ensure that things will actually happen because where we put our money is where things do happen. So hats off to the group that worked on this. And I look forward to the meeting Thursday night where we're going to talk about equity again. So thank you to all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Costa. Ms. Creason. I just want to first say thank you so much for all the time and energy. And again, just like I said for the last presentation, taking the long road to get to where we're at. These are not easy conversations. There's so much work, uh, heart work. You know, it's hard to have these very hard conversations and to say things the way they are and ultimately stick up for uh, our kids and families and staff of color and not just of color, but, you know, different gender diversity, um, who they love, you know, uh, diversity comes in a lot of different packages. And so I really appreciate us taking the time. And I really, inter it's my understanding as a district, um, we're really leading in this area compared to some other districts that are just starting this work. You know, we really dived in with commitment and have actually, you know, come up with some product. And again, it was over time. And, you know, what racism is to me is, black baby dolls hanging up in lockers and swastikas painted at schools and fake anti-black policies that are shared with a bunch of students on the first day of school. And I could go on and on, but that's what racism is. And, you know, I recently heard a quote about racism being so baked into America that when you work to uh, address it, you're called anti-American. And I just want to put that quote out there because it really hit me. Um, as a woman of color with a mixed son, um, you know, of course, I mean, we've experienced a whole lot. So, you know, I think it's important that we call things what they are. And I think that this is a great step in getting where we need to be and being really forward and thoughtful and transparent about where, what we expect. What is our expectation? Where is the bar for our whole district community? So I appreciate all the work that's gone into this and I'm excited to continue on this journey. Thank you, Ms. Creason. Dr. McKibben. Mike, will you turn your mic on? Dr. McKibben, will you turn your mic on? There you go, it's green now, we're good. The, the light, all right, <laughs> is that what it is? Um, I want to thank the equity department for what they've done, uh, particularly uh, one of the uh, terms that was used throughout uh, was, was particularly pointed to me, and that was the whole notion of courageous conversations and putting a mirror up to ourselves and seeing some of the places where we had a great deal of work to do because, in fact, the, the, the picture that we saw was not one that uh, was complimentary. The whole notion of, of looking at our curriculum and finding out the places where students could see themselves in the curriculum was extraordinarily important. The whole notion of that changing the curriculum, as Ms. Costa was talking about, by doubling the number of students of color who were taking advanced placement courses and that sort of thing. And the quality and the results of those courses did not diminish one bit. And that's the thing, we were, and there were many of uh, people that were afraid that it might, might uh, lower the quality. And in fact, that did not happen because in so many cases, the students didn't have the faith in themselves that they needed to have in order to take those courses. But by taking a look at ourselves, by saying that indeed equity will be a watchword of this district, uh, uh, we're making some significant changes and ones that we can all be very, very proud of. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you, Dr. McKibben. And thank you so much for the team for bringing this forward. This is um, the thing that I love the most about this district is that we're constantly um, evolving and rising to, to meet the needs as, as things transition and progress and um, 
there have been a significant amount of conversations. You know, it's been ongoing work, not just recently through the summer, but um, it preceded that for sure. And some of the events that we saw this summer, because we know that racism still is still here in our communities, in our neighborhoods, and it required um, a at least an attempt at a proportional response. Because the bottom line is, we're not reaching our kids in the way that we need to if they don't see their lived life experiences in what um, what is presented to them and um, every day at school. And so I'm certainly proud of this work. And um, for some, if it's a little bit uncomfortable or a little bit of a challenge, um, I think that means we're doing what we need to be doing. So uh, thank you very much. For, for the work that has gone into this. Ms. Vasquez, can I make a comment to that too? Sure. And you know, um, I think sometimes we wanna act like there isn't systemic racism in places. And when we, when we act like that's not the case, then we don't address the issues that are really out there facing our students and members of our community. And it was all of our responsibility and it's been a focus of the board and of the district to really make strides in areas of equity, but to call out that there is systemic racism in this district and we have to address it um, and we must address it and we will address it. You know, I, I, I appreciate the comments of the board and we're gonna continue down this path as we have. Um, you know, we're nowhere near where we need to be, but the, the work of the equity department and the partnerships that I think about that we've made in the last number of years you know, going back to EOS, Equal Opportunity Schools, and the, the strides, we can, we can go on and on. But again, still more work to do, but we can never be afraid to call it out because as soon as we do, we turn and we go in the wrong direction. So thank you to the board for supporting this type of work as well. Appreciate your remarks and um, the consensus in the room. Thank that you. Discussion item. Oh, sorry, Ms. Marshall or Ms. Fine, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yep. Just thank you for your support. This is a discussion item. It will return as an action item on our November 17th agenda item. With that, we are at item I-4, CARS Supplementary Retirement Plan. Mr. Oropalo, please begin when you are ready. Thank you, President Viasquez, members of the board, Superintendent Kern, Ms. Cunningham. Superintendent is recommending that the board adopt resolution 3010 to investigate the possibility of a pre-retirement incentive offered through the public agency retirement set services known as PARS. This retirement incentive must meet the goals, financial and operational objectives in order for the plan to go into effect. And I am here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Oropalo. I'll remind our participants, um, if you're joining us for public comments um, on any of our items, there is an uh, option on the Zoom platform where you can use the raise your hand feature and public comments are subject to a two minute limit. We do ask that your comments be limited to the item, which is item I-4, PARS Supplementary Retirement Plan. And I'll remind our participants that there is a general visitor comment at item L towards the end of the agenda. Ms. Bassanelli, do we have any public comments on this item? At this time, we do not have any hands raised. Do any board members have questions or comments? Ms. Fiasco, let, let me expand a little bit as well. You know, we brought this to the board last year um, and we, uh, went down the path and then COVID hit. And we really felt, and even in talking with our labor groups that it would have been irresponsible to continue on. Um, and our timing last year was kind of tough. We actually brought it to the board, I think in January. We're bringing it at a time where, as we know, we're heading into some significant fiscal challenges in the future years. Um, this may soften uh, some of the challenges we face down the road in terms of layoffs. Um, which I think many, if not all districts in the state will be facing in the coming years. But we have made it clear to each bargaining group that this is not an all or, or nothing, that we may have some groups that meet the threshold, others that do not. 
Um, it may pencil out for some and others it's not. We've got them all to agree. We understand that. We understand it's not an all or nothing. Um, and so this just allows us to start exploring this. The board, this would ultimately come back to the board for action um, and more information once we identify the numbers and we would come back to the board, present that, and then the board would decide whether or not they want to approve that. That would likely take place you know, in, in January or February. So just to provide a little more context as well, that's that's where we are with this. Thank you for the additional context, Mr. Kern. I'll turn it to see if there's any questions. Ms. Costa? Uh, having been a staff member when we had a PARS program that did not pencil out for us. I had always been very reticent. Every time we talked about retirement incentives, I flinched. I was so impressed with the work that staff did last year and the integrity that was taken to make sure that this program would be financially beneficial to the district and allow us to move forward. And I really appreciated that. I think one of the things that will make this so positive is the fact that it is not an all or nothing. All groups don't have to be in if they don't meet the threshold. And I think that will make a difference as well. But I really believe that the fact that we are pursuing this in a way that is going to be beneficial to our district, especially with the financial problems or challenges that could occur in the next few years. This is another example of staff being ahead of the curve. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Costa. Dr. McKibben? Got it, thank you very much. Um, with that, this is an action item. Is there a motion to adopt resolution number 3010, approving the PARS supplementary retirement plan as presented? Ms. Vieta. And moved by Mr. Hernandez. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Dr. McKibben. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Aye, that was unanimous. We are now at item I-5, variable term waivers. Mr. Oropalo, please begin when you're ready. Thank you, President Vasquez, Board Member Superintendent Kern, Ms. Cunningham. Super, the superintendent has recommended that the board approve the submission of seven variable term waivers to the California Commission on Teaching Credentialing, effective 11, or 8 11 20 through 6 30 21, for three cross cultural language and academic development waivers, two speech language pathologists, a social science and a childhood special education teacher for 21 22 school year. And I have, I'm here to answer any questions you may have about this. Thank you very much, Mr. Oropalo. Um, I'll be doing this prompt for each item. So if you're joining us for comments and you're joining via the Zoom platform, um, please indicate your desire to give public comment using the raise your hand feature. As a reminder, public comments are subject to a two minute limit. And um, we ask that for the time being, they be limited to item I-5, variable term waivers. As a reminder, there is still item L on the agenda for general visitor comments. Ms. Bassanelli, are there any public comments at this time? At this time, there are no hands raised for public comment. Do any board members have questions or comment? Mr. Hernandez. Ms. Costa, Ms. Grayson, Dr. McKibben. With that, this is an action item. Is there a motion to approve the submission of a seven variable term of seven variable term waivers to the California Commission on Teaching on Teacher Credentialing? Thank you, Ms. Costa. Is there a second? Thank you. All those please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. We are at item I-6, assignment of teachers outside regular base credential. Mr. Oropalo. 
Thank you again, President Viasquez, board members, Superintendent Curtis Cunningham. Superintendent is recommending that the board adopt resolution number 3011, authorizing the assignment of certificated employees who hold regular base credentials outside these authorizations during the 2021 school year. And I'm here to answer any questions you may have about this item. Thank you, Mr. Oropalo. If you've joined us today for public comment, a reminder that you can indicate um, your desire to give public comment at this time using the raise your hand feature on the Zoom platform and public comments are subject to a two minute limit. We ask that they be limited to item I-6, assignment of teachers outside regular base credential. Ms. Bassanelli, are there any public comments on this? Yes, we have Dee Fitz uh, with her hand raised. Dee, you are available to talk now. Thank you. Um, again, a little bit of lack of transparency here. Are we talking a kindergarten teacher should, could or <laughs> would be teaching high school chemistry? Are we talking about a high school PE teacher being put in a special ed classroom? Um, I don't know. What are you talking about outside their credential? I'm not seeing that it's clear on the board um, information here. So I would like some transparency. It very much concerns me that we're going to have a lot of people working outside their credential area. Middle school, high school teachers have single subject credentials. They're not well-rounded teachers. They're not necessarily meant to teach outside of that subject area. Are you talking about putting them in other positions because you need to fill those because we have so many teachers who are refusing to teach? Um, this is very concerning. I, I don't agree with this. Um, and I don't think that you even put enough information in the agenda here um, on this whole packet for me to even really have a voice in this or say anything. Um, it concerns me. Who's working in our special ed classrooms? Um, who's going to be teaching the math classes? So you really need to reconsider passing this one. Thank you. I'm going to turn it to my colleagues for any questions at the moment. Or right. Mr. Hernandez, Ms. Costa, Lisa, Dr. McKibben. I'm going to pull it up towards you. There you go. Uh, Mr. Opalo, how do these numbers closer to the mic? How do these numbers compare? to uh, last year uh, and if if they're higher uh, is it partially because of moving over to uh, the uh, uh, independent study and, and homeschool areas thank you uh, dr mckibben for the question the numbers we have reduced every year that we have brought this before the board um, these are these are teachers that that may be teaching um, in areas that are beneficial to our students. For example, Leslie Peoples is on here as an introductory to math. Leslie Peoples has a, has a multiple subject credential. She was also, when I was at Mesa Verde, my most talented math teacher. So having her being able to have the flexibility to teach her as a, as a high school principal at Mesa Verde was very helpful. In terms of the part that you were asking on the, on the um, El Sereno homeschool, et cetera, this gives the flexibility for us to meet the needs of the students who are in those homeschool um, under, uh, under the supervision of a teacher. You'll remember that as a homeschool teacher, a homeschool teacher will work with a family. The family serves as the teacher, the homeschool teacher as, serves as a um, representative of the district and works um, to make sure that the work is being turned in curriculum is being covered. And they may have um, kindergarten, second grade, third grade, fourth grade uh, students on their caseload working um, within the homeschool. So that's why they're all covered and that's why there is an additional amount this year in that area. But in the typical area that you're looking at, which is on the uh, attachment A, you'll see a reduction that we've, we've, and we've made a uh, concerted effort every year to make that smaller. So a, a really wise person I work with once said, can, we, um, can everybody hear Mr. Kern? I want to make sure your mic's on. Yeah, it okay, is. Okay, good. Um, said a lack of understanding does not mean a lack of transparency. And I would really encourage the community at times 
that this board has probably more background and has seen this multiple times. I would encourage you on questions like this when you see Mr. Oropalo's name, reach out, email him directly. He can provide you more background. You're probably not gonna get a super, super long detailed response on these things. Um, so just, just really share that. We'll, we'll take the time as, as even Mr. Hernandez said, the questions that were asked to um, Diana about the equity work and she responded, send us your questions to the appropriate people and we will take the time to answer those. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you all. This is an action item. Is there a motion to adopt resolution number 3011 authorizing the assignment of certificated employees to areas outside their authorized credential during the 2020-2021 school year? Moved by Dr. McKibben. Is there a second? And seconded by Ms. Creason. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. We are now at item I-7, District Committee Members Code of Conduct, Superintendent Kern. So the, the action there is that the board liaisons to the, the Local Control Accountability Plan Advisory Committee are requesting the district staff establish a district-wide policy on the use of social media, which we really need district-wide. In talking to Trent, we haven't had something like that. And that is just not for, I wanna be clear, not committee members, and I even heard one comment comment, it's, it's about district-wide employees, everybody, um, so that we would develop that use of social media and a code of conduct policy for committee members. And I believe, Ms. Costa, you said that there may be some CSBA language already around that. So tonight we just really, um, Dr. McKibben and Ms. Creason requested that this come forward. Um, and so if the board is interested in moving that forward, uh, we'll go ahead and do that. We don't have a, a, a hard timeline on this, um, but it's something we want to make sure like with social media that we do it very well. And then we'll research the other code of conduct um, policies, whatever is out there already we could look at. So, And I'll invite our board liaisons to add a little bit as part of the presentation before we go to um, questions. Ms. Creason. Yeah, yes, um, we did bring this to the board. It's just, you know, social media is so widely used by pretty much everybody, students, families, and the like. And, you know, we have a responsibility to keep students safe and we need to set guidelines and parameters. So rules are clear. That's what it comes down to. And I do agree. We need this across the board. Um, I think we did, if I remember correctly, I think we did start these discussions, but we want to make sure that this doesn't impede teacher or staff relationships with kids. So, I mean, I just want to make sure that we're including our um, staff in these conversations, teachers in these conversations, so that, you know, we have multiple voices at the table. But with the North Star being, we need to keep kids safe. We don't want kids to feel uncomfortable in any situation because of adults' use of social media. And I think that's very important. Oh, can I say one more thing? Yes. And I want to, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, the policy that will be developed wouldn't be retroactive. It would be moving forward. Correct. Yeah. We're, this is not, because I think there have been some assumptions made on that. This is not, we're going to go back and say someone should have known a policy beforehand. It's we're moving forward. That's why I'm, I'm even saying we are, um, we don't have a hard timeline on this. We're going to work on this, but we got a, a lot of other pressing things that we're working on. So we'll bring this back to the board at, as soon as we can. Sounds good. Thank you. Dr. McKibben, would you like to add anything to the presentation of this item? When uh, over time, we, we've been getting some, uh, some uh, concerns mm -hmm. and complaints. I remember a number of years ago uh, uh, when uh, even before I was uh, in my I had just come off curriculum instruction and it happened to be that one of one of the persons that I had nominated was uh, being a little harsh with, uh, with uh, uh, members of the staff. And my way of uh, correcting that was to go out to lunch with him and suggest that he cut it out and, and so forth. But we needed, we frankly needed a, a policy as we looked at, looked at our, uh, our policies and that sort of thing. 
and we didn't find them. And in fact, uh, so uh, when when a teacher, when a principal, when when a when a student, uh, you know, has a concern, we are absolutely obligated to check into it and make sure that indeed uh, uh, there. And sometimes there will be no there there, and there are other times though, that it will rise up to a, a higher concern. But we would be absolutely remiss as a board, as uh, frankly as responsible people when when particularly a student or a teacher says uh this this doesn't quite look right we've got to look at it but we and we didn't have anything concrete in there for us to to follow so as and uh miss creason uh, very correctly talked about we're not talking about anything that's retroactive and that sort of thing it's just we need a better footing than we have right now Thank you both. Um, I'm going to consider that the end of the presentation for the item and check with Ms. Bassanelli. Do we have any public comments on this item at this time? At this time, there are no hands raised for public comment. I will turn it to my colleagues. Do any board members have questions or comments? Mr. Hernandez? Just a comment that I, I appreciate. You know, I understand the why. And when we do develop whatever policy that we uh, develop, um, we do explain what the reason, you know, it is to, to obviously to protect kids. And secondly, that it begins with our superintendent, the board and everybody down the line, I don't mean down the line, but I mean everybody involved as a district in whole. So we're not singling out anybody. And that, that, communi that we communicate that very well with everybody involved, that they actually know what this policy means. So they, you know, could understand because it uh, it's very important and it's very clear that we communicate with every single person. That's all. Ms. Costa. I think this is another opportunity once the policy is written, when each of our committees meets at the beginning of the year for orientation, that this be another orientation, just like the Brown Act orientation uh, or the policies, uh, the committee protocols, what we do when we first come back. And I think that will be very useful. In terms of the social media, CSBA has so many resources that are available that we can draw upon. They've done whole day presentations on social media. Uh, they always do a presentation at uh, the annual conference. So there are more than probably we'll ever want to use, but it is a source that we can draw upon. Mr. Allen's been chomping at the bit to, to have a social media policy for some time because it's, it is really, it's not something to be punitive. It is a protective matter really to, to set those guidelines. And so that's really what we're looking for here going forward. And my comment is just that, um, well, first, I wanted to make sure I know, thank you, Ms. Creason and Dr. McKibben for presenting, but did you have any further questions or comments on the item? Um, you know, particularly in the current instructional format that we're in, it's just more critical than ever to make sure to be doing what we can to be protecting our students. And um, social media is definitely a difficult one. Appreciate my colleagues bringing it forward, um, appreciate the discussion. I hope there's, um, I, I anticipate that along the way as we develop one, we've got a, a number of resources already at the helm. Thank you, um, Ms. Costa, for, for raising that and um, look forward to seeing progress on this moving forward. With that, we are at item J, board reports. Are there any board reports? I'm going to go in order if that's okay. Mr. Hernandez have a quick one. I, I, I mentioned earlier that I was able to tour the uh, career tech new building at Del Campo High School, which uh, is going to be ready in December. So when those kids return back in January, they're going to have this incredible facility. Uh, and it, it's basically one big building. And in that building, it's divided up into four different career techs. One is a, the fire academy. And guys, they have a, 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 a garage gate that a whole a uh, fire truck can park inside. That particular looks like a fire station. It's amazing. 
And then they have the media room that would probably equal KCRA's uh, media. It's just unbelievable. And then they have the, uh, I call it the trades where, you know, you can learn about to be an electrician, a plumber, a roofer. And then which one am I missing? Uh, oh, the... Um, don't they have like a first responder or something? What? The first responders or something similar? You got the media, I'm missing one. But anyway, there's, oh, okay. a, there's one more. I've said that. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, it is very, it is very nice. And you guys, as soon as you can go take a visit, it is unbelievable. And those kids that that uh, you know that dab into these career techs that you know may not be going to college or university. They can learn and walk out of there with a uh, certification of being a fire academy graduate and on their way to being a firefighter. And it's, there you go, computer science. <laughs> tech, the, the tech lab. The tech lab. <laughs> so anyway, absolutely enjoyed it. And thank you, Mr. Cremata, for that tour. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez, Ms. Costa. Uh, we had curriculum and standards. I've mentioned it a couple of times tonight, and it was a very positive meeting. DLAC also was a very positive meeting, and it was the opportunity to see the resiliency of our parents and of our staff. Uh, the way the Chromebooks work is the translation process doesn't work on Chromebooks. And so they had to, the presenter presented a slide and then each translator had to translate that. So we heard the translation in five different languages. And then if anybody had a question about that slide, then the question was asked and then it was translated five different times. I thought they only were able to do one agenda item but it made me realize that if our families are going through this who are using Chromebooks, or it also made me wonder if our instructional assistants who've been asking for laptops instead of Chromebooks, if they're working with EL students, it makes sense to me now why they want laptops. So that was a learning experience for me. And I really, it was a hats off to resiliency and I hope that by the next meeting we have a workaround so that it can be done in a more efficient manner. Then lastly, I attended the parent education class for special education and the timing was so perfect on this. They were talking about getting students ready to go back for in-person learning, special education students going back for in-person learning. But what I thought about is it applies to every student going back. One of the things they said was start with a schedule. And you think that's so simple, but with little kids, having a visible schedule makes really good sense so that they know what to do first, next, and out, on through. But the one that I thought was really an outstanding suggestion for our families was don't wait until the night before kids have to go back to school and say, you're going to be wearing a mask when you're back in school. Start wearing the mask and increasing the time until it's equal to the amount of time that the student's back in session so that they're doing that while they're distance learning, getting ready to go back into a classroom. And I thought, wow, what a very basic suggestion, but it really makes good sense. If any parents interested, it's on the special education website. So they are videotaping all of these classes and you can go to the special ed website, click on it and watch the lesson again. I'm really sad because Thursday night would be the last of these, these three. And it's also the night of the equity task force meeting and, that I'll be at. So I won't get to see it live, but I will watch it on the website. So hats off to the special ed folks. They're doing a really great job of providing information for our parents. Thank you, Ms. Costa, Ms. Creason. <clears throat> 
Just a couple of quick things. I want to just give a shout out to all the teachers that are getting really, teachers and staff that are getting really creative uh, to engage kids in social interaction in new and different ways. I know Mr. A at Arden has just been really, I mean, he was recognized on our social media pages, um, just really going above and beyond to get really creative in ways that kids can interact um, you know, in this time of physical distancing. So I just want to, I know I've said it a couple of times that we're in this boat together and that we all need to get creative so that we can get our kids um, some social interaction. And there's a lot of dynamos that are really doing that work. And I know it's not easy. And that's another one of those you weren't trained in teacher school <laughs> to do, uh, but you're figuring it out and you're doing it for the kids. And I can say, at least for my kid, um, although he doesn't participate in all of it, he does participate in some of it. And it really does lift his spirits. Um, also want to do a shout out. I don't know how many schools are doing it, but I know a couple schools are going to be um, hosting groups, like little groups with counseling sessions so that kids can be around each, be with kids um, and work out some social emotional issues. And so I'm really excited to hear that more of that's going on. And of course, one-on-one -on -one interaction is available too. And then just a quick CAC um, or education, special education committee uh, I was not able to attend what you attended, and I bummed about that. But I have had the opportunity to talk to some of the parent leadership and just getting more information about what they want to see out of the committee. And we have been talking a lot about just identifying priorities directly from them and how to prior how to elevate those, think them out, um, put some planning behind it, and you know just kind of have some forward action on some great ideas that come from that parent community. So working with them to work that out so that they can work with staff to build a plan. Great. Dr. McKibben. I wanted to uh, talk a, a bit about something that happened to me this morning uh, that some of you know that I try to get three miles walking in each day and I happened to be uh, wa um, um, our dog was walking us as, as usual. And my wife happened to be with me because she was giving a test to her, her 190 students on Zoom and, and it was being done by a proctor. So she, she didn't, so she was walking with me. And we walked uh, over, uh, part of our walk was through uh, uh, Pastor Middle School's track. Uh, they have a track that's about a half mile long. It happened to be built by a rotary many years ago. And, and the rotary sometimes gets over there to, to clean it up. But I was walking through the track and and particularly in the area that had become grassed over, somebody had come along and cleaned it out completely. And, and it really was uh, uh, very nice. And we kept walking around and walking around and got to the other end. And there was this uh, young lady with her rake and that sort of thing. And, and my wife Celeste uh, was complimenting her on her work and, uh, and, and talked to her for a while. And, and then uh, she asked, uh, well, do you work, uh, 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 are you a volunteer? And she says, well, kinda. And, and we pursued it and found out that she was a bus driver. And, and here was this person who had just amazing pride in her work that she was doing and was almost kind of disappointed that she was going back to being a bus driver on Monday because she had uh, these projects that she wanted to do. But I mean, she was clearly probably working on a side letter or that sort of thing. But it was absolutely, I, I just was so impressed with how our, our classified employees and that sort of thing are stepping up to the plate and doing things that are way out of their class and that sort of thing because they so, care so much about kids. Yeah, the Teamsters, it really has been neat to see them in a completely different experience. And I think it's actually even going to build their relationship at the team at the at the school site. So, you know, kudos to Jim Shoemaker and his team for really working through that side letter agreement and and the the leadership of Teamsters as well for agreeing to that because that's we've we've been hearing stories again and again. So thanks for sharing that. Thanks, Kim. Thank you for the report. And I'm just gonna ask for your patience in advance. I have a couple of things that I wanted to report out on. Um, first, was able to, um, on the 14th, so right after our last meeting, was able to join our uh, business partners, Micron, uh, Sac Republic, and the San Juan Education Foundation to receive a $50,000 business contribution from our partners to 
go towards helping our um, resource our distance learning efforts. And so very thankful for our business partners and our um, San Juan Education Foundation and our other local partners, including the Sac Republic for stepping up to make that happen. It took place at Greer, it was really exciting to, to have staff there available to, uh, you know, got to do the whole big check thing. So that was fun. Um, but speaking of, since I'm there, I also got to join into a, I think it was scheduled, my attendance was impromptu, but a Greer virtual dance party with the full DJ. Um, that was exciting. And if you ever need a smile on your face, um, I recommend joining because they really know how to rock out. Although you do have to come prepared with some dance moves. I was very inadequate. Um, and so I was not prepared and I'm going to practice. Um, in addition to that, on Friday, uh, took place in um, bond signing on behalf of the district. So as part of that, and it's um, come up in prior um, items as well, as reported out by Mr. Stevens, but we refunded $143 million um, of um, Measure J at a cost savings of $11.5 million to our community and also, also authorized $150 million of Measure P and $30 million of Measure N. And like a lot of exciting events in life that involve money such as buying a house it was just a lot of paperwork and very um you know not there wasn't a whole lot of excitement leading to it but very exciting to be able to continue to support our um, aggressive facilities plans in that effort and want to thank the whole team um, mr steven mr Kamarta, everybody uh, the board as well for passing you know being important partners in passing the the measures and of course our community for voting to approve them um, Whole team effort. So I was excited about that. I was able to participate in um, the uh, a transitional age youth town hall hosted by the Muslim American Society Social Services Foundation. So at our last meeting, we actually had one of their organizers join us for public comment requesting participation. I was able to join as a panelist um, for their destigmatizing mental health for Muslim youth and um, the entire town hall was absolutely incredible. It was student led um, and student organized and hearing their very individual experiences and lived experiences and how challenging it is and hearing, you know, um, just hearing a lot about kind of the duality of their lives and how um, services specific to um, their religion and their culture is what's important and the, you know, the value of peer support services was really, really inspiring. I look forward to continuing to support their work, but appreciate the invitation um, to participate in that. I'm also participating in another year of the Meraki Mentorship Program that is co-hosted by the Rotary Club. So excited to have another mentee um, and look forward to, you know, last year my mentee really became my mentor too, and we achieved a lot together. So I'm looking forward to that again. And was able to also do some class visits um, to Encina and Rio and Churchill. I want to echo what Ms. Um, Creason said and what has been reported out in the past that our teachers have gotten pretty creative. Um, that's not to say it's easy, but um, I got to participate in a lab involving Skittles. And so that was fun. <laughs> um, that is the end of my board report. I appreciate you. Um, indulging me on that. We are now at item K, future agenda items. Do any board members wish to add any items to the future agenda? I do have one, colleagues. As you all recall, we had a large item of business that we took up immediately prior to COVID related to transitioning to by district elections. You'll further recall that in March, we adopted resolution number 2982 regarding the transition to by district elections by 2020. But of course, as a number of things have come across, it has been on hold due to COVID. As we began the process to transition back to in-person learning, I recommend we continue this line of effort and receive an update on the item. So absent any objections? Okay. And with that, we are at item L, visitor comments. Um, I would like to remind the public that comments are limited to two minutes under the Ralph M. Brown Act. The board is not allowed to comment on items that are not on the agenda, so we are not ignoring your comments. We just can't respond to any individual comments. 
The superintendent can refer items to staff who can follow up with you. And for those of us joining um, via Zoom, just as a reminder, on the Zoom platform, there is a raise your hand feature where Ms. Bassanelli will call on your name to begin your two minutes when she's ready. Ms. Bassanelli, do we have any public comments at this time? At this time, we do not have any hands raised. I do have one written comment that was submitted. Okay, please go ahead and read the written comment, Ms. Bassanelli. Okay, this written comment is from Tima Burgess. I am a parent of a middle school and high school student. Thank you to the SJUSD school board, the SJUSD leadership for delaying the return of students to school until January. I applaud you for taking brave action to keep our families safe in the face of racial fringe protesters, many of which don't have kids in our district. Thank you, Ms. Bassanelli. And I also just wanna take a moment to thank you for um, joining and helping keep, in, keep moving the meeting moving along. We appreciate your service. We do not need to return to closed session at this item, so we are adjourned. Thank you, colleagues.